One of the more problematic trends that has befallen the modern Christian church is that it has become enamored with something I would call spiritual celebritism. This is when a Christian is so enthralled by a celebrity that they feel the need for this celebrity to love Jesus and in doing so, bring about some sort of validation in their personal faith. They will search and scour for any modicum of belief in a higher power and declare the celebrity a blood-bought believer. A quick scroll down Facebook and you are likely to find a sponsored post from a Christian website with articles such as 10 celebrities you didn't know were Christians or look how this celebrity stood up for their faith. Many of these celebrities have not even proclaimed a belief in Christ and most live their public lives completely contrary to scripture. Lord knows what they do when they aren't under the paparazzi's watchful eye. The constant need for Christians to have a celebrity spokesperson has made it abundantly evident that far too many believers place too much weight on the oftentimes erroneous spiritual positions of these celebrity spokespersons. You would think that that was a book review written for Greg Laurie's newest book, Lennon, Dylan, Alice, and Jesus, the spiritual biography of rock and roll. But really, that was an article on goodfight.org discussing that celebrities are trying to raise your children. But to discuss this book and many of the arguments made in it is none other than the president and founder of Good Fight Ministries and pastor of Blessed Hope Chapel in Simi Valley, California, Pastor Joe Schimmel. Yeah, it's heavy. I mean, I found myself a little grieved today off and on, actually with quite a heavy heart when I was looking at this at different times. I thought, wow, how tragic, how sad uh, that so many parents, so many uh, believers, so many uh, pastors and teachers and Sunday school teachers have sought to help uh, the, the people that they are following the Lord, their, their families, their brothers and sisters in Christ, encourage them to, uh, you know, watch out for the powers of darkness and have no fellowship, as the Bible says, with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. And it breaks my heart because I thought, wow, Greg Laurie has, is, way, is very popular out there. And, uh, you know, uh, he's, he's actually turning his evangelistic type, you know, talents, quote unquote, into basically promoting these guys. And I know, well, hey, you know, I'm trying to, you know, bring people to Jesus through this. It was a two-way street. It, 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 it's a bridge that goes both ways. What's going to happen uh, as we've discussed this and, and, and talked about a lot of what's written in there is a lot of people are going to read this. They're going to put their guard down and say, wow, I, I didn't realize these guys were such, they love God. These guys are Christians. When we're going to expose in this expose that so many of these people that he's promoting as though they had some kind of relationship with God and uh, indicating that they're in heaven and so forth, or at least most of them, uh, we're going to see that they've been involved with the powers of darkness and there's no a clear repentance at the end of their lives uh, for the most part that, that we can see. And what's tragic about this, how many people are going to plunge themselves into their music saying, oh man, a great glory, a spiritual leader, a pastor is, is promoting them. Man, they must be good. It must be okay to listen to all kinds of secular music. Before you know it, it becomes a bridge away from God. And I'll give you one example, Chad. When I was looking at Alice Cooper, he promotes there, and he also promotes John Lennon and the Beatles. Uh, it was really interesting. Alice Cooper was saying, hey, I grew up as a pastor's son in an interview. I just saw recently as I've been checking this out. And he said, as I was, and, and then I was all in the church, man. I was going to Wednesday nights and Friday nights and Sunday. My whole life re re revolved around, you know, Christianity. And then he goes, in high school, the Beatles came out. And I began to mimic them. And then before you knew it, he was Alice Cooper doing depictions, theatrical depictions of people being decapitated on stage mock hangings with gallows out there, an uh, innocent-looking girl with a big butcher knife as though she's a, a butcher, just the most demonic thing. He was the Marilyn Manson of his day, and he's still doing so many of those songs, and Greg Laurie is promoting him, and it's wicked. Yeah, it's interesting. Before the introduction, it says this, and this kind of sets off the premise of the book. It says, there will be three big surprises when you get to heaven. Some of the people we thought would be there won't be. Some of the people we never thought would be there will be. Because of God's faithful promises, you and I will also be there. So I think this kind of starts us off with a little bit of a mystery, Joe, as to, wait, who on earth is going to get there? And how are they going to get there? And I'd be so surprised if this person and this rock star, because that's the entire premise of the book, the spiritual biography of rock and roll. And so we see that. But then, Joe, 
We're going to read his words. This is the opening line of the introduction of the book to really tell us why Greg Laurie wrote this book. It's time I admitted it. To quote the great theologian Joan Jett, I love rock and roll. And now, Joe, I, I think before we play some of the clips of why he... The first point he's having a problem is because he's following women preachers. Joan Jett, <laughs> yeah. or that she's a rock star. Or that she's a rock star, yeah. no, 100%. Yeah, both are not uh, not biblical in any way, shape, or form. But when we look into this and we see this, I know that even when I first opened it, I thought, well, maybe he means I did before I was saved, or I had these inclinations towards that before I was saved. But Joe, we're going to actually get into it, and we'll even talk about some of the things he's wearing when promoting this book to see that that love for rock and roll, that's in the perfect present tense, I would say. Yeah. And that's a current love that he has. And I think that's the premise behind the book, really. Yeah, for secular music, right? The scriptures say in, in uh, Ecclesiastes 7, uh, 5, it is better to listen to the rebuke of a wise man than for one to listen to the song of fools. What's happening is he's glorifying so many of these songs that are so anti-biblical, so anti-God. And in, in, in his book, he talks about how he and others were so into the Beatles, and he's still into them. And he talks about how these were they were the, they were the kids' idols. And I'm saying, yeah, he, you're right. They're idols. Greg, have you shaken those idols yet? Do you realize they're animated by, animated by demonic entities? And we'll get into that. No, I think that's a perfect time to see what he has actually written about this. Because in the book, he writes, I have a large photo of the Beatles in my office. And a young person seeing it recently asked me why I am such a fan. I told him they effectively provided the soundtrack of my life. Every song brings memory of my childhood, both good and bad. There were many other artists and bands I listened to growing up, but no single band impacted me the way those four lads from Liverpool did. I mean, this yeah. is a current love that as a pastor in his office, very interesting, these are his words, not mine, in his office, he has a picture of the Beatles, Joe. Mm -hmm. This is who he is glorifying so that when I come to get counsel from him, right, if I was a member of his church and came to get counsel from him, I'm going to come and see, guess what? My pastor loves the Beatles. Then there can't be anything wrong with listening to that music, right? That's the, especially if he's a spiritual leader, you feel like God's leading him. Oh, man, the Beatles must be okay with, they're okay with Greg. They're okay with God then, I guess, you know, because he's like, represents God, doesn't he? And before you know it, you get your immersed, yourself immersed in music that is, we're going to see, very demonically inspired. No, it's true. And, you know, you mentioned this already, Joe, speaking of the idols as well. And if you don't think that these musicians are actual idols that people look up to, we don't have American Idol as one of the biggest shows in America <laughs> for no reason. There is a there is truth to that, and people really do worship at their feet. And that's all I could see Greg Laurie describing over and over again in this book by his own admission that people worshipped these bands. And yet, let's look at Greg Laurie doing a little tour in his office talking about some of the figurines he has of the Beatles. Steve McQueen, the Steve McQueen Bullet Mustang, Ronald Reagan, the Beatles, collectible little Beatles from over the years. And then finally, my old bicycle, a replica of the bike I used to ride. I collect strange things. Yeah, those are some strange things. And if you notice above that bicycle of him collecting strange things, you'll see a ticket to a Beatles concert as well that he has. And Joe, I, I can't help, but I can't miss it. He's also wearing a pink Floyd shirt while promoting this book. Guys, this isn't a situation, Joe. And I have to ask you this, and I, I find it almost comical because as someone who came to the Lord after watching the video, They Sold Their Souls for Rock and Roll, I feel almost like a goofball asking the question. But to start, he's showing all of this and all these collectibles, and this is why the book is written and all this. He wants to bring the gospel. But can we even bring the gospel, or can we bring the gospel while showcasing maybe the history of rock and roll, is there a way to do it that's actually biblical, unlike I believe this book is? You know, it's interesting uh, when you, just the fact that you mentioned the Pink Floyd shirt. I mean, Pink Floyd was way into mysticism, not into the Lord Jesus Christ, into the occult and so forth. 
And I'll just give one of their songs because we have so much to cover. But, I mean, what message am I sharing with everybody else? Hey, Pink Floyd's cool. Check them out, you know. And you start listening to Pink Floyd. Also, you're hearing a song called Animals, right? And you're, you're hearing lyrics that were inspired by uh, an occult book on witchcraft called The Book of Shadows. And in that song, Animals, uh, or that album, Animals, I'm sorry, there's an animal, uh, albums called Animals, you have a song called Sheep. And it's all about Jesus being a wicked butcher. He, uh, it takes the 23rd Psalm and it twists it demonically. And it says, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. It starts out and then starts twisting the 23rd Psalm. He, 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 you know, he, uh, trans, you know he, he basically turns me into lamb cutlets like he's going to butcher me. And it's just, and it's really wicked. And it's just the way it's portrayed is just really creepy. And it talks about how we will rise up and make the buggers eyes water, calling Jesus a bugger. And to promote something, we love Jesus, man. We don't want to get close to anything that's antichrist. And it just breaks your heart because uh, there's a lot of things in Pink Floyd's music that are occultic and so forth. And and I'm hoping that he's just, it's hard to believe because he's done all this research, that he's just absolutely incredibly naive. I mean, we did do a video called They Sold Their Souls Rock and Roll, which we have a 10-hour version and a three-hour version, and we show the occult history of music and why this is, was so grievous for me was like, wow, Lord, so many people have warned, uh, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of Christian leaders have warned about the spirit of the Antichrist behind this music. And so many believers have been sanctified and gotten out of the music. And a lot of times when they get out of their music, wow, their lives change, man. They fall in love with Jesus. They start to get in, into music that glorifies God. They obey the scripture, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Their lives are transformed. But now they're being dragged back into or seduced back into, back to the mud. And it's scary. I, I'm, I'm, I'm fearful for Greg. And it's like, well, hey, did you guys talk to him? He's already been. He's already coming to how uh, responded to how people have, you know, told him they disagree with what he's doing. This and need to be writing songs about their history and everything. And he's writing, writing uh, books, you know, yeah. Writing books like this and so forth. And he's disagreed with that. Well, uh, our hearts break because we're seeing that this is actually going to lead a lot of people astray. And Jesus warned. He said, "Whoa, you know, into the, you know, sin's going to come in the world, but woe to them by whom it comes." He says, "If we cause one, just one little one, to stumble, fall into sin," he's talking about falling into sin. It's better that a millstone, a large millstone, be hung around neck, we'd be thrown in the depths of the sea. So, as Christians, especially as Christian leaders, we have to be very, very careful. Romans fourteen talks about that. Even if you feel you're okay in it, but you're not supposed to lead others who can have defiled consciences, but weak consciences, led into a thing that they believe is evil or wrong. By grease the skids for him. Yeah, and I would say this as somebody, like I said, I came to the Lord as an, I was an atheist, and I came to the Lord when I saw the history of rock and roll, and there was a there was a spirit behind it, and I believe that this is, without a doubt, from reading the book, this is in direct disobedience to Ephesians five, specifically verse eleven, because when we are not to have any fellowship with, and yet these are the things that he listens to, these are the collectibles he keeps. All of these bands that not only these songs were wicked over and over again, even in the book, Joe, he talks about some of the occult things in them. He talks about some of the background between George Harrison and some of the, he you know, Maharishi. Beatles, Pied Pipers that led a whole generation astray. percent, hundred percent. And it, you look at that, but yet when we read Ephesians 5.11 to see, to have no fellowship, have nothing in common with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them, then we see him not exposing it, not speaking of it in a negative way, but just leaving it out there. Here's the spiritual journey of them. And really, you should come to Jesus. It would have been awesome if they did too. How about the fact that this is spiritual wickedness in heavenly places? How about the fact that we're actually in a spiritual warfare? And I can say that as someone who came to the Lord through having the things that were my idols ripped down and tore down, not in line of, I just want to be a big meanie, and I, you know, but looking at it as you have been duped, Chad, you have fallen for this. They have fallen for this. Mm -hmm. And I know I don't like to be duped by people. It doesn't feel good. And then when, when it's taken off of your eyes, when that veil is taken and removed and you're like, wait a second, I've actually been, because the Bible says he was not with me. That's Jesus who said it. He was not with me is against me. Mm -hmm. That's when I gave my life to Christ and got down on my knees and these guys are not with him. And to talk about them positively, about how great they are as artists, oh yeah, there were some bad things, we don't know where their spiritual journey is, because we'll get to some of those quotes, to do that and not to warn, not, oh, I'm just a big fan, I love these songs, they bring back memories, not to warn against it, 
I believe it's a travesty, it's devastating, and it's dangerous. And that's where we are with this. That's what I have to say before we dig into some of some of his arguments. Because Joe, he's going to say right here, he has a biblical model. And sadly, this model that he is using is so wrong, and it's been used by J.D. Greer to say you the should call— The way he's twisting the model. Yeah, the way yeah. he's twisting the model. Uh, it's been used by guys like J.D. Greer to say, you know, we should call transgender by their preferred pronouns. It's been used— to, by guys like Dr. Frank Turk to say we should definitely go and take these books and Harry Potter's just like Jesus and we can show people Jesus with Harry Potter in ra- rather than exposing it. And so let's hear Greg Glory use a similar unbiblical model or a twisting of what the Bible said actually happened there on Mars Hill. You know, someone might ask, why have you written this book, Lennon, Dylan, Alice, and Jesus? I don't want to learn about these people. Wait a second. The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 17 went up in a place called Mars Hill at the Areopagus. This is where all of the philosophers hung out to talk about the latest things. Paul took the time to assess the culture, to look around. And I have to say that Athens, Greece, where this all happened, was filled with idols. It was filled with monuments dedicated to false gods. But just in case they missed one, They had one monument to the unknown God. So how does Paul address these people? He says, men of Athens, I perceive that you're very religious. Today we might say, hey, it looks like you guys are into spirituality. Paul continues on, I noticed you had a monument to the unknown God. That's the one I want to talk to you about today. Then Paul quoted one of their own secular philosophers to build a bridge for the gospel. That's what I do in this book. So Joe, once again, we have someone saying, I, you know, I'm just taking, and by the way, it's really interesting. He's standing before a bunch of idols right behind him. He is stand, literal idols. What, what Paul's preaching? Huh? Of, no, but I'm talking about Greg Laurie. Oh, Greg Laurie too. <laughs> Greg Laurie. Paul's denouncing them though. Paul's denouncing them. Greg Laurie is sitting before the Beatles and saying, you know what? Isn't this Artemis awesome? Weren't they a great guitarist? Isn't yeah. Diana awesome? Have you guys been to Ephesus? Paul's office, if they, you know, if he had statues behind him, says, well, I don't worship a man, but they're they're cool still because wow, that that one guy could really sing, you know, or what have you. It'd just be pretty amazing. No, it, it's it's ridiculous and it's sad and it really does hurt my heart thinking about the people that will see that and see Paul exposing those false gods for who they are. And he does expose them for what they are. In fact, when he uses the word, it's usually translated religious. Uh, sometimes, like the King James, superstitious. I see that you're very religious or superstitious. We talked about this when we dealt with Frank Turk, dealing this with Harry Potter and so forth. Uh, he uses the, the Greek word, which they would have heard in the Greek, literally means to fear or worship demons or daemons, and, uh, which they understood to be spirit entities. But Paul understood to be demonic entities, and Paul goes on to repudiate these demonic entities. In that same message, he goes on to talk about that you know the one true God made the heavens and the earth. You need to repent and not worship these guys because they didn't make the heavens and the earth these these demon gods. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 21 and 22, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So I think it's imperative that we understand as believers that we are in a spiritual war. And the the, the uh, idols of that age were not just, they weren't simply, Chad, uh, made of hands. They were, of course, they were made of, they were, you know, anything from a tree stump to uh, different types of uh, metals and so forth and rock, and they made all these gods. But they also worshipped human beings. They worshipped the emperors, Nero, Domitian, and so forth. And that was considered idol worship. The Lord warns against that. They'll be worshipping the Antichrist in the end days. Well, these guys, John Lennon actually went to a Beatle Corpse meeting, with, according to Albert Goldman in his tomb of a, bio, of a, a biography on the Beatles, and he actually asked the Beatles, Apple Records, by the way, with the bite out of the apple, you know, uh, he actually asked the rest of the Beatles, you know, he, he declared that he was God and wanted to be presented as God of the world. I think they were the rest of them were embarrassed and realized that's probably not going to go over well, and they just didn't follow through with that. But I think one thing we need to understand is that, and I, I'm not just going to speak the truth here, is uh, Greg Laurie, in, in many ways, has become somewhat ecumenical, but at the same time, uh, he teaches a form of easy believism uh, at this point. He hadn't always done that, but he teaches a form of easy believism to where, I mean, the worst type, I mean, where you can actually uh, reject Jesus as your Lord, say, no, I'm not going to be a disciple and a follower of yours, Christ, but I'll just accept what you did on the cross for me and continue to live a wicked life. I won't be a follower of Christ. I'll just, I'll just accept what you did. 
And Jesus doesn't leave that option open. In fact, right here, and this is this is really tragic. In fact, uh, in Greg Laurie's discipleship, giving God your best. This is from the back cover. It states, in a biblical, straightforward manner, Greg Laurie shares Jesus' definition of discipleship. Discipleship requires an unabashed, uncompromising commitment to Jesus Christ. Every disciple is a believer, but not every believer is a disciple. Discover the dynamic difference. And then in the book itself, page 30 and 31, we read this. The requirements of discipleship are different than the requirements of salvation. To be a Christian, you need to believe in him whom God has sent. And then you will receive eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Of course, he doesn't mention repent and believe or anything like that. It is a gift. To be a disciple is to take up the cross daily and follow him, making his will your will. It is a commitment. Goes on to say a little further down, as you are learning, every disciple is a Christian, but not every Christian is a disciple. So you have Christians that just believe in Jesus, but they don't want anything to do with following him. They're rejecting his call to take up their crosses, deny themselves daily, and follow him and say, no way, I'm not doing that, Jesus, but you're going to save me anyway because I'm, I'm, I'm believing you. So they can go on being drunkards. They can go on being adulterers, fornicators, homosexuals, thieves, murderers, and all that if you can just believe and not truly really follow him. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 and 10, be not deceived. The wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God, neither, and he goes on to like fornicators, and adulterers, and uh, effeminate, homosexuals, drunkards, revilers, thieves, and so forth. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. And we see that over and over again. He, and the Bible says, by the way, it doesn't say he that practices sin is only a believer, but will still go to heaven, but is not a disciple. It says he that practices sin is of the devil. Well, we read that over and over again. The Bible tells us if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. And when Jesus talks about you need to take up your cross, deny yourself and follow me, he goes, in his talk, goes on to say, if you save your life, you're going to lose it. If you lose your life, you're going to save it. It has everything to do with eternal life as to whether or not you're truly having true faith in Christ because to truly have faith in Christ is to trust him, is to lean on him, is to follow him. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Not my sheep they believe in me, but they don't follow me because they might decide to become disciples later, but they're still my sheep. It's just lies. And if you and I'm stating this, I thought about this, I, I think the reason he's so weak on sanctification and separation from wickedness is because he has this OSAS, once they'd always say, just believe and you're saved no matter what you do afterwards mentality. And that has far-reaching consequences, that doctrine. I believe it's led millions of people potentially to hell because they've said, oh, I could just do what thou wilt. And they're hearing that from the pulpits, and it's do what thou wilt in the church. And it breaks my heart that Greg is now on team, do what thou wilt to a degree. No, I, I think that this is a great time, Joe, to to show also, because reading those quotes, I mean, that's devastating when it comes to what a biblical disciple is. And for those who are in Christ Jesus, we've been predestined to be conformed to the image of Amen. his son. And so when we look at that, we see that. And you know what's interesting, Joe? We can show you right now. In fact, we're going to show you right now, this has not always been Greg Glory's view, and I just have to i have to say, this is a, me surmising, but you kind of wonder what changed, because this video that we're about to show you right now, this video is about 12 years old, and this is him describing the difference between those who are believers and non-believers, and the question is, can one lose their salvation? So he's actually asking the question, you'll hear him ask, Specifically, were they ever saved in the first place? Can a Christian lose their salvation? Seems whenever I do a Q&A period with anyone, this question comes up. Can a Christian lose their salvation? And the way I like to respond to this question is with another question. Was the person saved to begin with? I think a lot of times we're wondering if a person has lost their salvation when quite frankly they may have never really been our genuine believer at all. If you're really a Christian, number one, you will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This is based on 1 John 4, 15. If anyone confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. Number two, if you're really a Christian, you will obey the commands of Christ. Not perfectly, not flawlessly, but you will obey the commands of Christ. 1 John 5, 3, this is love for God to obey his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. Anyone who is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Now this is a problem for some people. 
They obey the commands of God they want to obey, and the ones they don't like, they ignore. Someone said to me a while back, or asked me this question, Greg, what do you do when you come to a verse in the Bible you don't agree with? I thought, that's a classic question. I said, you change your opinion because you're wrong. I mean, the Bible's not negotiable. So if you don't agree with it, you need to change. Number three, listen to this one. Are you unhappy or miserable when you're sinning? If you're really a child of God, you will be unhappy or miserable when you're sinning. 1 John 3, 9, everyone who has been born of God does not habitually sin because his seed remains in him and he is not able to habitually sin because he's been born of God. Listen, when you are a real believer, you will not be happy in your sin. You will be unhappy. And I would even take it a step further and say if you're comfortable in sin, maybe you're not a child of God. Number four, did you keep yourself from the devil? If you're a true believer, you'll keep yourself from the devil. 1 John 5, 18, we know whoever is born of God keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. Now, John is not suggesting we need to keep ourselves saved. That's the work of God, kept by God unto salvation, the Bible says. But I do need to keep myself safe. See the difference? I'm not to keep myself saved, but I am to keep myself safe. And by that I mean I must avoid certain people, places, and activities that would make it easier for the devil to tempt me. And I must hang around people and be in places and do things that would build me up spiritually. Keep yourself from the devil in five. And lastly, do you love other Christians? If you're a real believer, you'll love God's people. 1 John 5, 1 says, everyone that believes that Christ is the Son of God loves his child as well. Wow, Joe, I have to say, uh, there were a number of things that are completely contradictory to what you've read mm -hmm. already in that message. And, Which I read from his mouth, from his own book, right. And as I was listening to that, I listened to that after reading a lot of this book, and I thought, Man, if he would have just applied that there, he would Amen. have been able to yeah. give a wonderful warning. Yeah, he said some things we totally agree with right there. Warnings are important for us in the body. I mean, that's what keeps us safe on the road. It's, it, it is so important to have those warnings, and it's the job of a pastor to do so as well. And so when we see that, and I hear that, and Joe specifically, keeping yourself from the devil, that portion he was talking about. Yeah, he said you'll, you need to keep yourself away. If you're born again, there's a context. You know, you'll avoid people that'll tempt you and so forth. Yet through this book, he's delivering people into the belly of the beast, you know, because he's glorifying these guys and uh, talking about how they're heaven bound for the many of the guys, he's, a lot of main guys he's bringing up. And uh, it breaks my heart because uh, Calvary Chapel, when it first started, it had a lot of very strong, not only evangelistic preaching, but a lot of emphasis early on about being separate from the world. You know, I remember when we, uh, Doug and I and my wife and wrote a bunch of songs and an album came, that came out called Leave It to the Rock. And uh, that album came out and Calvary Chapel, K-Wave here in California, gave it several, some of the songs, a lot of airplay, except Chuck Smith would not play half the songs because it had a saxophone in it, we were told, because Doug, who you know was the main guy behind that album, uh, let me know because he knew one of the guys that's in the studio there and said, yeah, we can't play the stuff with sax on it. I'm like, well, that's if that's what Joe Chuck runs uh, Calvary Chapels, and he that's his station ultimately, and that's his conviction. Fine, but I said, why? The sax could be a beautiful instrument. It certainly is in our praise and worship music. Very expressive, very beautiful. And they said because it's Chuck said it's shaped like a phallus. And I was like, really? Okay, well, if that's his conviction. I don't think that's what the design was, unless I'm missing something, you know. But uh, anyway, so I thought it was interesting. But there was sometimes an emphasis to stay away from the evil music of the world. But now it's being glorified. And a lot of the Calvary chapels, not all the Calvary chapels, but a lot of the Calvary chapels, it, it's this easy believism that's now being taught that I quoted with Greg earlier, that you can you can be a believer and just not follow the Lord and, and everything's good. And you fill churches with people that aren't born again. And what's going to happen? And you want to keep those people. So what do you do? You talk more about just we're saved by grace and you don't emphasize sanctification at all. And a sister came and visited the fellowship Sunday from out of state. Uh, she was here, and uh, and she visited us with a couple of her, her kids. And 
I'd met her before, and it was great seeing her. And, and uh, you talk to people after fellowship, we encourage people and love on the Lord together. And and she was talking about how she's been loves the live stream because she said it's so hard because we're going to Calvary Chapel and it's just no conviction. There's we never it, it, it's and people are running amok. And that was you know I'm not giving the name of that particular church. No need to. But she shared that with me, and I said, it's kind of interesting. I go, I've seen that. And in fact, my wife and I, before we started Blessed Hope, I said that uh, we were in a church in Thousand Oaks, Calvary Chapel. And like I said, there's some good Calvary chapels out there, but you've got to be really careful. Uh, and we used to be able to tell people, you know, we don't agree with the pre-trib. We don't agree with OSAS, once saved, always saved. Not all of them were like that. In fact, not all of them are like that today. Raul Reese certainly wasn't. You know, he actually preached a strong message. Uh, but we, we, would, we could, years ago, it was safer to say, you know, they go through the scripture, but beware of some of the doctrines that are off. You can't find a good church, get plugged in somewhere, and maybe the Calvary Chapel will work. But you can't say that today because a lot of them have gone so off the rails. And it's just heartbreaking to me because I told her I was in a fellowship with my wife and we were driving to a totally different town outside of Simi Valley. And my wife, we were there for about a year. And my wife was having a hard time, you know, with, with the messages because she's, I'm never convicted. I'm never challenged to be sanctified, to grow and my salvation and, and, and watch out for sin. And, and <laughs> we were there almost a year at that point. And I thought, you know what, I, you know what, that the conviction is definitely lacking here. And then we got there Sunday after that or so. And I said, Hey baby, look, he's in Luke 17. I pointed to a scripture, you know, uh, when he warned out, but warned about Lot's wife, remember Lot's wife, three words. I go, praise the Lord. He's going to deal with this. Praise God. He's you need to be convicted, baby. He's going to get you here. You know, so just kind of playing with her. We go, praise the Lord. He'll, he'll, you know, there's some convicting stuff in here and hopefully he'll preach on it. We got to the verse, remember Lot's wife. And I'm like, okay, praise God, Lord, help him, whatever, you know. And then boom, it was all, not a, not a word about Lot's wife. It was, praise God. Lot was a carnal Christian. You know, he was a sinful man. He was a carnal Christian. And and God raptured him out of there anyway. And that's a picture of the pre rapture because the angels took him out. Uh, of, of Sodom, and it was then destroyed. So even if you're a carnal Christian, don't worry, you're still okay with God, and you'll still be raptured. On that very day, rapture says, happens. <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's wrong in, in, yeah, both in, in both ways. First yeah. of all, it says over and over again, first of all, why did God take Lot out? If he could find even one righteous man, he, or so many righteous men, he would spare it. He didn't find a lot of righteous people, but Lot he took out, and we're told in First Peter chapter 2, over and over and over again, uh, that righteous Lot was vexed, King James, were grieved by all the sin around him. That he was a righteous man, we're told. So I was, I'm like, oh, Lord God, what is he doing? And then when the angels take him out, it's not seven years before the judgment. When he takes him out, the wrath of God falls, a picture of the second coming. They were just obliterated like at the second coming. It's a picture of a post-trip coming on the same day, as you mentioned, Chad, that he was taken out. And I told her, I go, man, I went through the same thing, and I know it's really, really tough. Well, that's years ago that I went through that. And... Greg, at that time, back in those days, I remember going down the road and I'd turn on Christian radio. Sometimes I'd hear Greg Laurie. I heard him on First John before, saying, if you're born again, you won't practice sin and so forth. And then before you know it, I'm like, man, I can't even send people over to the Harvest Crusades anymore because Greg is now teaching that you can just be a believer and be saved. You really don't have to truly turn from your rebellion against God and become a disciple. And I think that is a lot of what's going on here is he's let his guard down. And just like what's happened in the Old Testament and the New is that now you have leaders leading people to the idols of this age. No, I think that's a really good point. And you know what? I, I think it's important. And we wanted to lay kind of the groundwork on what we see theologically, how you can get to a place where you start writing books like this, where you no longer are calling out their sin, except for maybe here, you know, there was some occultism here and stuff. And it's just mentioned as a byword, not recognizing how wicked a lot of these guys are. saying, man, we got to stay away from these artists because they'll pull you into this occult world. Yeah. And so we wanted to look at that before we get into now the nitty gritty of some of the things he did say about these bands. Start looking at what he's saying and what the artists have said, who they really were. Yeah, I think that's the important thing is let's always make sure that when we're doing this, it's good to know what the artist has said, either in song or interview or anything like that. So let's look into it, because in the book, on page 20, Greg Laurie writes, And yet, the Beatles were not anti-God. In fact, they were all raised with some form of Christian upbringing. They were Church of England choir boys. They had been peach-cheeked lads in choir stalls, singing classic Anglican hymns like, All praise to thee, my God, this night, and for all the saints. And Joe, before I hand that back over, especially considering 
what the entire Beatle philosophy was. If you guys didn't know this, Aleister Crowley, the father of Satanism, was raised in the Plymouth Brethren. That's right. He was raised in the Christian faith, and that doesn't then, therefore, mean that he wasn't anti-God. His dad was an evangelist. Exactly. And so when we look at that and we see that statement, those two things do not align. Your upbringing does not mean you aren't anti-God, and that also doesn't give you a license to listen and and really revere the songs of fools. And by the way, Aleister Crowley says in his hagiography, as he calls it, hagios for holy, which is just ridiculous, uh, he states that uh, being a Plymouth Brethren, he was brought up to believe once saved, always saved. And it didn't matter what he did, he couldn't lose his salvation. And he became the most licentious person on earth, Mr. Do What Thou Wilt, right? Well, it's interesting. Uh, now, he, does he has, as you mentioned, Chad, the Beatles in, the, you know, when he, in his office, you know? Can you imagine you come to my office and I got Zeppelin back there? And it's like, wait a minute, man. Isn't Paige, didn't he buy a list of Crowley's mansion over Locking Ness, overlooking Loch Ness? And, and, and didn't he say big names aren't made, made today through Ready, Steady, Go, but through, a, a, you know, Practice the Magic of Lester Crowley? And you start saying that, I, I, what would I say? Oh, but no, they got some good tunes. And, and you know, really deep down, I mean, they knew God before. Would I say that? That would be, I can't even come to my mind to get even close to that, you know, because that was the band I was into. Okay, but to glorify them and say, hey, they were somehow good because maybe they grew up with, you know, it's, it's just ridiculous. But, well, well, the Beatles weren't like that, though. Oh, yeah, they were. Okay, John Lennon, in being interviewed by Ray Coleman, uh, a famous statement he made by Melody Maker years ago. Obviously, he's been dead for years, but uh, he said to him in an interview, I've sold my soul to the devil, according to John Green. Now, John Green was uh, Yoko Ono. Yoko Ono, by the way, why did John Lennon marry Yoko Ono? She was totally into mysticism like he was. She was called herself a witch. You can type in Yoko Ono witch and Google it, and you'll see her with her witch's hat and John Lennon all funky and stuff, and she called herself a witch. Well, they uh, lived in the Dakota days in the last years before he was killed by Chapman, by Mark Chapman, uh, who was praying to Satan. And I think his time was up, and we'll see what happened there in a minute, maybe, perhaps. But uh, he was living in the, he was totally paranoid. He Anything that went off in his room because he kept hearing voices, I believe he was just totally being given over to Satan for destruction, you know. He's hearing voices over and over again in his bedroom. Uh, but he brought John Len uh, brought John Green in, their tarot card reader, to lead them in New Age mysticism and trying to handle the spirits and the future and everything else. And he was their tarot card reader. Well, Yoko Ono and John Green, at Yoko Ono's request, because she wanted to make a pact with the devil, and he had already claimed to sell his soul to the devil, they went to Colombia in South America and when they got to Columbia, they looked for a bruja, a witch, and John Green and her got together with the witch. And uh, John Green doesn't give us a real name, but calls her Nora and said that uh, this was not, that Nora was not just, you know, white she witch. was not a white witch. She was, in, although we know there's no real difference, there's still the same powers, but she was a practitioner of black magic. And uh, they were, Yoko had to seal the deal with Lucifer. And she ended up paying $60,000, sacrificing the animal. In fact, I read what happens here in John uh, Green, who lived with them in the last days before John was uh, put uh, killed. The old witch slipped her powerful fingers into a pocket and removed a folded piece of paper, the contract, the, the pack with the devil. This she opened with deliberate care and placed on the altar as if for the dove to read, because that was a sacrificial animal. You're going to sacrifice a, a, an innocent dove. Nora rolled her eyes back in her head, right, uh, possessed, and prayed her prayers of sacrifice. Suddenly, deftly, the hand with a stick did its work. The dove had no warning and made no outcry as the instrument pierced the back of its neck and erased the brain. Slowly, Nora removed the point uh, and held the victim outward. Sign, child, sign now uh, for Yoko Ono uh, to sign. And Yoko actually tried to cheat the devil because she had John Green sign in her place, you know. These guys know what's going on, and we talk about... Some of this stuff, I mean, we've got some of this in our video. They sold their souls for rock and roll. Exposed a lot of this, a lot of mind-blowing stuff. And, and that's why our hearts, my prayer, I pray and I'll continue to do this, Lord. Lord, please open Greg Laurie's eyes to repudiate what he's done here. Yes, you can show darkness, but you need to repudiate the darkness as such, not grease the skids where people feel comfortable in darkness. You need to shine the light on people. We've seen thousands of thousands and thousands of people come to Christ who they sold their souls for rock and roll because we do exactly what Paul said, have no fellowship with the unfruitful deeds of darkness, rather expose them. And he talks about 
uh, you know, waking up, sleeper let the light of Christ shine on you. And we, we turn the lights on. We turn the Jesus light on, man, and show who Jesus is, and we preach the truth. But it's interesting because, uh, you know, you have this, this, this sacrifice uh, taking place, but it's also important to understand, and these are some points you need to understand about the Beatles. Jean, John Lennon, a lot of people say, uh, you know, John Lennon talked about, and the Beatles boasted that we're more popular than Jesus now. And yeah, that was a horrible thing to say because, I mean, now a lot of people, you, you, you say, hey, do you know who, uh, you know, George Harrison was? I mean, most young people don't know who he was now today. You say, you know who Jesus was? They know, okay? Most people. Uh, but you know what? They didn't just say we're more popular than Jesus now. Because uh, some, I heard one pastor say, well, they were more popular than Jesus at that time. Well, maybe in this country and a few other European countries. But guess what? He didn't just say we're more popular than Jesus now. John Lennon said Christianity will go. It will vanish and shrink. I need to argue about that. I'm right, and we were proven right. He had an antagonism toward Christianity. In fact, Derek Taylor, their press officer, said this. I mean, I am antichrist as well, but there, speaking of the Beatles, are so antichrist, they shock me, which isn't an easy thing to do. So privately, when they weren't singing, I want to hold your hand, you know, they would publicly say Christianity is going to vanish, but privately there was an antagonism against Jesus. They, they, they believed in God? Uh, they, didn't, they didn't love Jesus, that's for sure. Uh, in fact, uh, John Lennon, yeah, he opened himself with demonic forces. He was writing songs. He was a channel. And he, over and over again, he talks about feeling like he was possessed and how he channeled lyrics. And he talked about he was like, he said, I was like a hollow temple. One spirit would enter my body and then it would leave. And then another spirit would enter my body. In fact, that's why uh, Albert Goldman wrote the book of John Lennon, huge book on John Lennon called The Lives of John Lennon because he was so many personalities. There was all these different uh, spirits using him. Although, of course, Goldman likes to look at them as archetypes because he doesn't have a biblical worldview, but we know we wrestle against flesh and blood. But spiritual wickedness in high places. John Lennon said, when the real music comes to me, it has nothing to do with me because I'm just a channel. It's given to me and I transcribe it like a channel. But my joy is when you're like possessed, like a medium, you know, I'll be sitting around and it will come in the middle of the night or at a time when you don't want it to, to do it. He says, that's the exciting part. I don't know how the blank, I wrote it. I'm just sitting here and the whole blank and song comes out. So it's, you're, you're like driven and you find yourself over the piano or a guitar because it's been given to you or whatever it is that you tune into. Now it's interesting when you think about this, we're not as Christians supposed to seek mediums. We're forbidden to seek occult practices to seek where the occult is condemned in the Old and New Testament. We're forbidden to seek mediums, that is, those who channel entities. When you have a man who he and his wife both acknowledge contact, contacting Lucifer, Satan, for powers, okay, and they become becomes the leader of the biggest band in the world, and he admits being, like, possessed, saying it's like possession, and he's a channel writing these lyrics. Uh, I'm sorry, but Greg Laurie shouldn't say, wow, they were sure talented, which is what he does through these books. We'll get into Hendrix and others where he's like, wow, what an incredible talent. Yeah, well, let's look at what did Hendrix say? Where is he getting his music? And Greg Laurie needs to step back and say, and use, as you mentioned earlier, Chad, what's the biblical worldview? What does the scripture say about music? The most repeated command in all of scripture, and that's for you and me, is to sing unto the Lord. Do you know that? By far, it blows out all the other commands, uh, not as far as the most important commandment, but it's the most repeated one. It means a lot to the Lord. The biggest book in the Bible is a songbook. The book of Psalms, amen? Christostom, one of the early church fathers, said that God gave us the book of Psalms to keep us from the music of demons. Now we have more evidence than ever that those that's such a reality. So let's actually take a look specifically at what happens when you look at the history of the Beatles and don't simply whitewash it and say it wasn't that bad, they weren't too anti-God, but here's the real truth behind a lot of what they were thinking, doing, practicing, and you were listening to, Greg, and still listen to. It was through the influence of the Beatles that millions of youth around the world were almost overnight turned away from Christ to the gurus of the East. Gurus like the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi were given a platform to pass out mantras like candy to the youth. Hippie youth began repeating these mantras believing that they were in some way scientific when in fact they were calling out on the names of Hindu gods and demons. Yoga is actually a word that means to yoke and speaks of yoking with pagan gods. God's word warns that these false gods are actually demonic beings and Jesus Christ warned against the repetitious praying of the pagans. 
Well, before the Beatles came around, I don't think Indian spirituality and things like that were an everyday part of Western culture. It was entirely the hippies, you know, thanks to the Beatles, who decided to, you know, go to India and, you know, discover yoga and meditation. Now we all have yoga on every corner. You know, there was never anything like that before they came along. They really wanted a spiritual revolution, a, a transformation. It was time for a, a generation to assert themselves. And this is the revolution that the Beatles caused. This revolution was challenged after John Lennon claimed to be more popular than Jesus Christ. This was a wake-up call to many young people around the world as they took to the streets and publicly destroyed the Beatle albums. Don't you forget what the Beatles have said. And don't forget to take your Beatle records and your Beatle paraphernalia to any one of our 14 pickup points. Sadly, this wake-up call did not last very long as society at large fell back asleep and the Beatles would launch their next assault with Sgt. Pepper's Only Hearts Club Band. The song states that it was 20 years ago today that Sgt. Pepper taught the band to play. The album came out in 1967. Crowley had died 20 years earlier in 1947, the year Leary claimed he passed on the baton to him to bring in the satanic revolution. This made Sgt. Pepper a likely reference to a Lester Crowley, the father of the new eon. John Lennon summed up the entire Beatle philosophy before his death by quoting Satanist Lester Crowley. Lennon stated, The whole Beatle idea was to do what you want, right? Do what thou wilt. Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band album is covered with a collage of people known as the Magic Crowd. These are the faces of different people that the Beatles considered part of the mystical club. The Beatles described them as their heroes and people they looked up to. In this crowd you find pictures of one-worlders like Karl Marx and mystics like Edgar Allan Poe and Carl Jung and Aldous Huxley who Crowley reportedly turned on to mescaline. The Beatles also placed a picture of occultist William Burroughs, who claimed to have become demon-possessed after killing his wife on the Sgt. Pepper's album. Also making the cast was the most popular starlet of the 1960s, Jane Mansfield. Mansfield was a high priestess in Anton LaVey's Church of Satan. Mansfield admitted to using her Satanism to both seduce and gain worldwide fame. The Beatles also placed a slew of Eastern gurus on the album as they continued their assault on Christianity. Incredibly, one of the people who was to be pictured on the album as part of the Beatles club was none other than Adolf Hitler. Hitler was yanked presumably because he was considered too controversial to appear on the album. Hitler's picture can be seen on the sidelines just prior to the shooting of the album cover. It has been well documented that Nazism was rooted in the occultic teachings of Madame Blavatsky and others. Aleister Crowley claimed that Hitler was his disciple and was seeking to implement the teachings of the Book of the Law through his policies of the triumph of the will. And of course, as we have noted on the top left, we find the picture of none other than Aleister Crowley. It is believed that Crowley is the one that the Beatles are referring to when in the song Sgt. Pepper's they state it was 20 years ago today that Sgt. Pepper taught the band to play. It was 20 years before the release of this album almost to the day when Crowley died and many of his followers believe marked the beginning of the new age. Crowley declared that he would lead an army of youth in the revolution to implement the new age and apparently the Beatles dubbed him Sgt. Pepper. John Lennon stated, there were very few things that happened to the Beatles that weren't really well thought out. Lennon said that he realized that he was part of a club of mystics who had been initiated into the same spiritual club. God's word in the book of Revelation describes Satan's church as the whore of Babylon. She is depicted as a sorceress and Revelation chapter 17 verse 4 states, quote, The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with the abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. A depiction of the satanic church or the scarlet woman, as both Crowley and Anger refer to her, is found on the Sgt. Pepper's album. Crowley taught that the beast and the scarlet woman would gather their children into their fold and bring the glories of the stars into the hearts of men. Notice on the Sgt. Pepper's album, we see a sorceress adorned in scarlet and with precious stones and gold and pearls. Notice also that she is holding up a golden cup in her hand as the book of Revelation states. Notice in her other hand, she's holding an upside down pentagram. The London Times said that Sgt. Pepper's was, quote, a decisive moment in the history of Western civilization. It was a decisive moment at this time in history as Satan made major inroads in preparing the world for the coming of the Antichrist. Wow, Joe, when I look at that and when I see the evidence there, I have to say it brings me back to when I gave my life to Christ after seeing a lot of this and, and recognizing there was a spiritual war going on 
And I know in, in Greg's book, like I said, he'll talk about it and, and, and faintly caveat many of these occult and, and Hinduism and call them Pied Pipers and all that stuff, but then whitewash it over and over again. And, and I just see when I'm reading that, that stuff or hearing that when I'm watching that, I'm seeing anti-God all over the place there. Yeah, it's always as though he wants to like separate their singing and their music from what was going on. When we start to realize, you know, that John Lennon talked about, you know, and, and Yoko and so forth, signing the pact with the devil, you know, and that he's just this channel, it all comes out of him. You can't separate the music from the message and from the spiritual realm. It's almost like saying, man, you know, I know those prophets that were worshiping Baal, you know, uh, and they're cutting themselves. You know, I know, I know what they're doing was evil and you want to stay away from Baal, but man, they sure could scream. They sure could sing, man. And I wish we had soundtracks of their music, man, because, you know, yeah, we don't want to pay attention. We don't want to follow what they're following, but it was really cool. No, man, why don't we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs as the scriptures command us to, and why don't we make sure we're separate from the evils of the world, you know? And it's interesting because in that clip, if it went on even further, we expose uh, very clearly that those two albums, that came out, Sgt. Pepper's, with their satanic majesty's request. And Kenneth Anger worked with the Beatles and the Stones to put those out in the same year. Kenneth Anger was a co-founder of the Church of Satan. He uh, did a uh, movie called Loose for Rising where uh, Lester Crowley is promoted and he was a Crowleyan Satanist and a pedophile too, by the way. Anyways, you have Crowley is being pushed and the Beatles and the Stones got together according to a book called Up and Down with the Rolling Stones written by a man who lived with the Rolling Stones and was a drug, drug runner uh, for years during that time, he said the Beatles talked long in the night about drugs and, and, and music and how they're going to change the world. Yeah, they did. And they put those two albums out together. It's their satanic, Majesty's Request, and, and we, we show the Beatles and the Stones. There's the Beatles are on the Stones album, the Stones are on the Beatles album, a couple of them, and it's all psychedelic, and it's all, it's all a big deception. And I don't expect Greg Laurie to know all that because I don't know if anybody's given our, us our, his, him our video. He's very popular in the but, Calvary Chapel movement. Uh, yeah, because I think uh, Chuck allowed for hundreds of our videos to be passed out to Calvary Chapel pastors at a pastor's conference, and many of them got, the, uh, got it, but some pastors were upset because it's talking about the music we grew up with. Well, how about being concerned about the, all the people that have been deceived by them and led away from Christ to hell? And what about, oh, well, they've got some nice songs like Imagine. Really? Imagine, I mean, imagine, what's the message? It's an, the Antichrist message, man. It's it's all about how imagine there's no heaven above us, you know? It's easy if you, you try. Know? Below us, yeah, it's easy if you try. Below us, below us, no hell. I mean, get rid of God, get rid of judgment, you know? Uh, and all the world, you know, no more countries, you know? Globalism. It calls Jesus orderism. a liar. That's my biggest yeah. problem. And let's he, come together and be one. You know, and all I, the world will live as one. That's the book of Revelation, guys, and times. And John Lennon said, he goes, and I think this is important to understand, he said, yeah, nobody accepted that political message at first, but then I dipped the song in honey. Music. And that's the thing is, would we be reading John Lennon's stuff if it wasn't the music wasn't there? No. Would, would Greg Laurie be all into John Lennon's writings and, and, and what he wrote about if they were just poems? Absolutely not. It shows you how powerful and seductive the music is. Even guys like Greg Laurie can get sucked into it and promote it. No, and, and, and when I think of Imagine and, and when I think of them literally saying that Jesus is a liar. That's what the song sings. Because if yeah. you imagine there's no heaven, then all of Jesus is teaching. That's where right. He told us over Good and point. over again, where are we supposed to lay up our treasures? So we're supposed to lay up our treasures in a heaven that doesn't exist? Jesus rose from the dead. I trust him when he tells me there's a heaven. And when you talked about dipping in honey, I truly believe that's exactly what is happening here. I yeah. mean, really. And yeah. I, and I want to say this because, well, what did, what did Greg write about his spiritual welfare? On page 82, he actually has a small sentence that just says he was born again that describes this experience that he was going through when he was watching Billy How Graham. How does John Lennon was really born again? That's what he says. And if but, he was really born again, according to what he said in the beginning of the clip that you played on him, he would have had a radically transformed life because Greg said your life would be transformed, you know, and you wouldn't be practicing evil anymore. That's not what happened to John Lennon. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is that it's very convoluted when you think of all of these messages put together because... Even as I go through this, this is on page 82 of his book where he says he was born again. He talks about him watching a Billy Graham uh, sermon online. Then after that, even calling in to the 700 Club to talk to Pat Robertson. But one of the guys that Greg Laurie actually interviewed said that that born again experience lasted all of two weeks. 
And he said, well, maybe it lasted longer. And he goes on to an explanation of visiting Japan and so forth and, and visiting a church there and being a nice, humble guy that he got a report from. Right after that experience, he wanted nothing to do with Jesus, by the way. And then it's really interesting, Joe, because he actually says that he matured. And he said one of the last ever interviews that he gave before his passing, he said he was no more a Buddhist than he was a Christian. And quote, I'm a most religious fellow. I was brought up a Christian and only now understand some of the things that Christ was saying in those parables because people got hooked on the teacher and missed the message. If you just simply took those parables or I could simply quote from Greg Glory's teaching that we played earlier that you can't just choose those things you want to obey. It's so interesting that he's yeah, writing these things and, and choose those things. But to quote him here, the fact is, is that you need to believe in the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ, the person. The person of Jesus Christ Amen. is how you come to salvation. Salvation is not simply taught in a philosophy. Salvation is not simply taught in an idea. Salvation is taught and completely proclaimed through the person of Jesus Christ. So if you miss some sort of message that you wanted to take from that parable and missed out on Jesus, you've missed out on everything. And so to even quote that and to see that, it's really, really heartbreaking to me. And this seems to be dipping John Lennon in honey so you don't feel so guilty about listening to your Beatles albums. And it breaks my heart because when I think of sanctification, and I remember this this took place when I was a younger believer. I remember I, I went to go meet someone. Someone was so excited for me to meet because this is an old friend and they had gone through some struggles, but now they're walking strong with the Lord and I'm really, my, my, my wife at the time was really excited for me to meet them. And she, I was a new, um, I was the new boyfriend at the time. And she was like, oh, you got to meet him. And I remember during a discussion, we talked about music and I said, yeah, you know, I have a real tough time with a lot of the Christian artists that specifically when you listen to their songs, I can't tell if they're talking about their boyfriend, their girlfriend, their wife, their friend. I can, I can't tell if they're talking about Jesus. And she goes, you know, I remember when I used to be that way. But now I realize I can listen to secular music and see God in it. And I knew from that day, I never wanted to get a pl get to a place in sanctification where I become less and less like Jesus Amen. and more and more like the world. And what I'm seeing here is, is, is dipped in honey, this message, and then the end caveat. Well, was he saved? I don't know. You called him born again in that sentence. He was born again. Yeah, this situation once saved, always saved. You believe he's in heaven right now. If you're really consistent with what you believe 100%. now. percent That's my point exactly. That we see the contradictions in his own teaching over the years, and then we see it coming out, and the fruit of it is, I'm a huge fan of these bands, so let me dip this in honey so you don't feel so bad. And your sanctifica sanctification process at best can be hindered. Because guys, when we get to Psalm chapter 1, and when you read Psalm chapter 1, this is something I put on my cell phone as a young believer so that on the front cover, so that when I would open it, I'd make sure, better go read your Bible before you're looking at text messages. And reading Psalm 1, meditating on the Word of God day and night is somebody who is going to be like the tree planted against the water that bears fruit in its season. Amen. But what about the other guy? That guy that doesn't meditate on God's Word day and night. And what are you doing when you're listening to songs and memorizing them? You're meditating on them. You're meditating on people who are meditating to demons, by the way. And are you not sitting in the seat of scoffers? Some of the things yeah. that he called Jesus when he was writing some of your favorite songs, Greg, some of the things that they called Jesus, some of the things they said about him, and you sit at the seat of scoffers hey, meditating on their junk. John Lennon blasphemed the Holy Spirit. John Lennon, uh, instead of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, he said Father, Son, and then he calls the Holy Ghost Mickey Most. He makes And, it, and it, he writes that Jesus is a fascist Spanish garlic-eating B A B A S T A R D. I mean, it goes a lot deeper. That would be without That's a in, father, the father in heaven that Jesus kept yeah, crying to. Right? That's right. And uh, he blasphemed the Lord over and over again. And near the end of his life, we're talking about that's when Yoko was going because he was afraid to leave his apartment, you know, because all these demons are around him. And he's trying to re up, I guess, his pack with the devil because that's what Yoko's doing for this new career of his and what have you. And keep in mind, when you have him saying he sold the soul of the devil, her going to South America, sacrificing an animal, I mean, this is. This truth is stranger than fiction, folks. This is John Lennon, the biggest, most popular band ever, right? And the leader of it, uh, they're re-upping re in some way. And when you think about that, and you consider that he's not only talking about that, but he's literally putting Crowley on his album, Sgt. Pepper's, working with Kenneth Anger, the co-founder of Church of Satan, who's a Crowley Satanist, to put that Sgt. Pepper's album together with, with uh, 
uh, Satanic Majesty's Request. And then in a 1980 interview with Chef, an interviewer in a Playboy magazine, the whole Beatle idea philosophy was do what thou wilt. He knew what he was doing and that we would take the wicked music that came through them. It was not just, just these guys are really good musicians. No, they opened themselves up to the demonic world and they're channeling music. So it breaks my heart because what Greg is doing there, he is whitewashing it. There's be all kinds of people that are going to be getting into demonic music and influenced by the demonic realm. And that is serious stuff because we, you know, we've documented, I mean, we didn't have to document it. Greg admits it in the book. They influenced millions of people. Why would you, and he called them Pied Pipers that led them astray. Why would you not give very strong warnings saying, hey, stay away from the music though. I'm exposing, hey, these are some of the things that happened in their lives, but ultimately they needed Jesus. And if they weren't surrendered to Christ at the end of their lives, it's too bad, but here's your chance to get right with Jesus. You know, I, I hate to use this analogy, but I have to be honest with you. I think the reason why is the same reason that so many people that were pastors that are addicted to porn won't talk against porn at the pulpit. It's because they're practicing it. And the fact is, is that he's a fan of these bands. That's why Pink Floyd is on his shirt. That's why he's doing these. The, he told us why he wrote the book. It's sad and I love rock and roll. It's embarrassing yeah. at the same time. It's like, it hurts my really? heart, man. Doesn't Jesus, don't we want to be so in love with Jesus that we don't need to venture into the occult and occult music and glorify things that are, are wicked? Just... No, and, and it's sad because I have to be honest, you know, I do a lot of research. I love reading. And this book was one of the more giant pills I had to swallow because I was like, how on earth are you saying these things? And how are you not giving the warnings? And it's like, you're a pastor. Yeah. That's a shepherd. That's someone who is trying to make sure your sheep don't go astray. And it, it just breaks my heart. And 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 the Beatles, I, I hopefully you guys are seeing the warnings that we're trying to give. Don't go down that road and start listening to that music and being someone sitting in the seat of scoffers, people who are mocking God and we're under the influence of the demonic realm, not recognizing that we're wrestling not simply against the flesh and blood enemy, but there are rulers of the darkness in heavenly places and they're coming after you. And when these things are pushed aside, I'm telling you what right now, it is dangerous. And the Beatles weren't the only ones that he did this whitewashing. Yeah, before you move to the next yeah. one, Chad, I just want to mention one thing is, is uh, and, I, and I, I'm not saying, I mean, there's them really godly, God-fearing Calvary Chapel pastors out there. Oh, yeah, amen. You just got to be very careful anywhere you go. You need to check out whoever's teaching, including if you visit our fellowship, a Blessed Hope Chapel uh, in Simi Valley, California. You come, it's like, you don't just check your mind at the door. You test everything by scripture. Amen. But uh, a lot of times, a lot of these leaders idolize these artists. And what happens is they won't warn about, just like you said, some pastors are into porn. They won't warn about porn. Same deal's going on, like you said. Well, you know, I got invited to a church uh, down the highway a ways, and I've spoken to a lot of churches through the years and did a pres presentation on music. And there was more people that had their lives transformed, I was told by the pastor, and, or I was told by the associate pastor, that were more transformed at that particular Sunday, including family members of leadership there, and their lives were radically changed, and they were so excited. I say that because I was supposed to come back a couple years later because of the great transformation. So many people came to Christ. They saw this fruit. And praise God because a lot of people that get ministered through our ministry, a lot of people right here in our fellowship, they're Jesus lovers, man. You see the transformation. And I was invited back. But then all of a sudden, they were canceling. I said, oh, okay, you're canceling. I go, what's up? And the associate pastor's like, I'm embarrassed to say this, Joe. He goes, but the pastor, he realized that you did an expose on Bono of you too. And his dog is named Bono, and he really loves Bono. And Bono's like his favorite artist right now. And I was like, yeah, in our expose, we exposed how Bono uh, said he wanted to start a, a Zoo TV, which would compete with MTV, and the band did, because he wanted to be an eye to the world, to the youth, so they could see the movies of Aleister Crowley. And I have, I'm not going to go into Bono here. I'm totally, I'm just going to say, and, and I was like, wow, well, is he concerned about what Bono is teaching? Because he's... He's pro-baby killing, you know. He says Jesus is uh, is not the only way, you know. The way is narrow to keep fundamental stuff, all said, that yeah. stuff, coexist. And we get into Satanism and stuff in our expose and so forth. And I thought, wow, pastors have to be very careful that they're not idolizing, don't have idols in their lives where they put, what do you know you put an idol in your life? When you put the words of a man and his reputation above Jesus and you go by him and you're ashamed of Jesus or you don't let Jesus compare. And I don't know where that guy was totally at, that pastor, I don't judge his heart, but guess what? I'm saying mm, something's wrong there, though. And they ended up inviting me, and I preached the word, and there was fruit again. 
You know, mm. thank God they they still got me in there. No, oh, praise God. And and these things are so important, and and we need to recognize these things and see them for what they are. And you know, it's interesting. He talks about the million dollar quartet, and when he talks about that, and and the one artist we're going to specifically hone in on here. And and by the way, we go over a number of artists. If you go to and you watch, they sell their souls to rock and roll. Specifically, Joe goes over. I got saved through, so I didn't go over anybody other than watching it. But but nonetheless, when he talks about Elvis Presley here. This is what he says. Elvis Presley, Johnny Cass, Carl Perkins, and Jerry Lee Lewis, true pioneers of rock and roll, were all church-going country boys who believed in Jesus. But the devil seduced their souls and didn't let go for decades. However, they eventually found their way back to the light and rolled in his glory. And the one that I think we should hone in on here is probably the biggest one out of them. And that is none other than Elvis Presley, Joe. And I know we have a clip that we want to show from the Soldier Souls for Rock and Roll that you guys can see here because, Joe, before we even get into some of the other stuff that Elvis was into, let's just see how he, Elvis used Jesus throughout his lifetime to, in order to cover some of his sins. I was in the living room when she came in, and uh, I said, Elvis, this is Priscilla, Priscilla, this is Elvis. And I, said, I had these visions of all of us just going to prison for life. I, you know, I was scared to death. She wasn't even 14 yet. Elvis lived with young teenage Priscilla in fornication for nearly five years until he was pressured for the sake of his public image to marry her. Elvis's marriage, however, never changed who he really was as he turned from fornicator to adulterer. Let's face it, from the time Elvis became famous until the very end, he never at any point stopped seeing other women, including with Priscilla. Exactly never right. stopped. He was having her around when he wanted her around, see? Elvis used Jesus Christ's name as a cover and actually was so promiscuous that he participated in orgies, sleeping with several women at a time. You know that girl I was with last night? Oh man, I'm gonna tell you. She could raise the dead, boy. Regarding Elvis's gospel music, Albert Goldman in his book Elvis, The Last 24 Hours, declared that, quote, essentially Elvis was a phony and that he feigned piety. Incredibly, what you are about to see is Elvis describing one of his sexual encounters as a hot lunch and after finding out that he's being miked, changing gears by singing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. I'm, I'm, I'm I had a hot lunch, all right. <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, how was your lunch? <laughs> Chad, Elvis, there's a mic up there. Now, Joe, before we even get into, and we have a clip to play regarding how his life ended, I think it was very interesting, his own friend saying, until the very end, he was caught into adultery. He was just continuing to yeah. cheat on, on Priscilla. But Greg and, would have us believe he's he was heaven bound. Rolled into glory. Yeah, it's It's sad. It's heartbreaking. It, it, it angers, angers me because it, it, it angers me when I hear what he just did with Jesus there, right there. Right. You know, he uh, he's a total phony. I mean, it's one thing, you know, I mean, he's mocking Jesus to the so-called Memphis mafia that around him, you know, and some of those were his cousins and, you know, and so forth. And they were the closest people to him. They, they, they wrote a book called Elvis, What Happened? And they ex talked about his occultism. They was into, felt he had occult powers and all these other things. But that he would take the precious name of Jesus who gave himself for us, right? And then he's caught talking about, you know, sleeping with all these different women and glorifying it and, and so forth. And and then, uh, he, he oh, you, you better put a monologue over that, Elvis. I mean, it would be one thing, it would be even bad if he just started saying, oh, well, let's talk about, pretend we're talking about something else. And never, But you know what? He's using the name of Jesus. The Bible says in 1 Peter, do not use the grace of God as a cloak over your malicious, over maliciousness. And that is so wicked. And it shows you what he was about. So people say, oh, well, he did a gospel album. Yeah, that guy did a gospel album. And this is a guy who felt he was in touch with spirits since he was a little boy. Mm -hmm. uh, he thought it was his twin brother, Aaron, that died uh, at, at when, they, when, they, when he was born. His brother died. He continued to hear this voice. And, and then he felt he was a New Age prophet. And then he felt you know, a New Age messiah. Uh, uh, and that, you know, he heard these voices. He, he would read on stage like Don Rickles, remember the comic? He, he goes up to him and he says, read this, Don. And he would read from Madame Blavatsky, okay? She's the woman who said that Satan is our redeemer, okay? He'd read from her stuff on stage and indoctrinate his audiences. And it's just crazy because, uh, you know, I'm sure we're going to talk about, uh, well, did he really roll in the glory? I mean, how did he die, you know? 
He was sitting on the toilet when he died. It is important because we're talking about Greg Glory saying, yeah, Satan had him, and they took him down all these bad roads. But in the end, they came back. And he it's very convoluted, Joe, when you read about even the Million Dollar Quartet and Jerry Lee Lewis and so forth, because he does mention some bad things they did. But then all of a sudden, oh, yeah, but in the end, yeah. they really came to the Lord, even though he was feigning piety all along. Yeah. He tells the story that, trust me, we have this video with over a million views on YouTube. We've gotten plenty of emails from huge Elvis fans who tell us everything they think. And specifically, oh, yeah, well, one time someone brought up a thing and said, you're the king. And he looked at them in concert and said, no, Jesus is the only king. Yeah, that's fine. You can feign piety all you want. And the demons believe in tremble. And the demons believe they in tremble. They call Jesus the Son of God. That's right. And then when you also look at his, the people next to him saying, he never once stopped being an adulterer. All the way in what? Until he came to Christ? No, until the very end. And just as Joe mentioned, here are here is how he ended up passing at the end of his life. Sadly, what blossomed in the 1960s was a sewage out of the cesspool of Satan's heart. Things like drug abuse were the very things that killed Elvis. What you see before you are the pills that represent what only one doctor prescribed to Elvis in 20 months before his death. No one is out of reach of drugs, man. Here is a man that had it in the palm of his hand and started off with it that way, and the drugs took it away from him. Elvis's autopsy revealed 14 different drugs in his body. Dr. Norman Weissman, director of the Bioscience Laboratory, testified that he had never seen so many drugs in one body. Incredibly, the night that Elvis died, his body was filled with drugs and his soul was filled with occultic lies. He died reading a book called Sex and Psychic Energies, a book about the very occultic forces that he had tapped into to initiate the world into sexual license and promiscuity and the lies of the New Age as the king of rock and roll. Elvis took his packet of medication and started reading a book on psychic energy then. He thought that would help him fall asleep. Then I fell asleep. So at about 8 o'clock, I woke up because Elvis was restless, saying that he just couldn't sleep. So he called downstairs for Ricky again, and Ricky came up and brought up uh, another packet of medication. He took the book on psychic energy with him, and he started toward the bathroom door. And I said, no, don't fall asleep. And he turned and smiled at me and said, oh, okay, I won't. I'll never forget, I grabbed Elvis by the shoulder, and I pulled him over, and I saw a sight that haunts me for the rest of my life. His face was blue bloated. His tongue was black and half bitten off. That's right. And it didn't take me two seconds to realize that, that Elvis Presley was dead, dead, dead. The truth dead. of the matter is that Elvis, the king of rock and roll, was killed by the very rock and roll lifestyle that he promoted and so epitomized in his very life. Besides his obsession with sex and drugs in the occult, Elvis was also obsessed with death. Elvis was so obsessed with death that his former disciples admitted that he would take them through graveyards and visit funeral homes as late as 3 a.m. to wander around the slabs looking at all the embalmed bodies. All of Elvis's fame, fortune, women, drugs, music, and the demonic powers he had tapped into could not bring Elvis happiness in the end. It was one huge, brutal lie. On the outside, Elvis presented the picture that he had it all together, but on the inside, he was the most miserable man on earth. Pastor Hamill, who pastored First Assembly of God in Memphis, stated that when Elvis had visited him in the late 50s, at the pinnacle of his success in rock and roll stardom, that Elvis declared, quote, I'm the most miserable young man you've ever seen. I've got all the money I'll ever need to spend. I've got millions of fans. I've got friends. But I'm doing what you taught me not to do. And I'm not doing the things you taught me to do. Nearly a decade later, in 1967, Elvis would attempt suicide. Elvis would later declare, it's better to be unconscious than miserable. Albert Goldman in his book, Elvis, The Last 24 Hours, presents a case that Elvis may have ended his life by committing suicide. In the end, Elvis found out the truth of God's word. The wages of sin is death. And he rejected the gift of God, eternal life through Jesus Christ. He did not heed the warning in God's word. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he that sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap eternal life. For those who have ears to hear and eyes to see and are not deluded by the image, but see through to the reality, Elvis' life was a big lesson. Jesus Christ warned, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Now, Joe, it's sad to me that instead of warning and using this as a warning, which, by the way, what book did she say he was reading? Was it the Bible? I, I don't think so, Joe. 
before he went to go die on a toilet. Yeah. I mean, using all of these drugs, that doesn't sound to me like he was going to the light and rolling into glory. Yeah, the, that's that's the reality uh, from the testimonies. He was into the occult and into sorcery. And the Bible says all sorcerers, or, or says sorcerers will not inherit God's kingdom. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Revelation 21, 8. It says that sorcerers will go to the lake of fire. Revelation 22, 15, 14 and 15, they won't enter the holy city. Uh, and on and on. And, and the message in Revelation as well, in chapter 9, verses 19 and 20, is that the folks in the end get judged by God and they partake of his wrath because they don't repent of their various sins, including the worship of demons and sorcery. Yet Greg wants us to believe that he rolled into glory. And what message does that send? What message is Greg sending to all of his fans? They're like, wow, you could live a debauched, wicked lifestyle, get into the occult, Hinduism, mysticism, sex, drugs, rock and roll, and you can die in rebellion to God. And as long as you made a confession earlier, you're, with, you're right with God. And he knows deep down that's not true. He knows the scriptures say without holiness, no one will see the Lord. He knows the scriptures say be not deceived. These types of folks will not inherit God's kingdom. And we need to do true, genuine evangelism. We're telling people you need to repent and turn from your sin. You need to continue in faith because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, he that endures the end will be saved. The scriptures warn that if we don't persevere in the faith, Paul said we'll be cut off. And so we need to continue in the faith, continue to trust Jesus. And that's what the early church taught. I know right now it doesn't tickle people's ears. People don't want to hear the warnings, but praise God, there's always a remnant of people that love God's truth. And I praise God so much for audiences among them. Yeah, and let's let's use this as a time for warning. And that's one of the things that's great is when you do correct somebody who's come out and taught something so false that maybe getting people, let me get my old Elvis records back. You know, maybe I'll, I'll buy my Elvis stuff. Well, you know what? What about when you just completely sugarcoat and instead of saying really much negative outside of, oh, they use some drugs and so forth, but so did I back in the day. Instead of doing that, this is a picture of Jimmy, Jimi Hendrix, who Greg Glory talks about. And under the title, it just says the greatest. Jimi Hendrix could play behind his head and with his teeth, getting sounds out of his instrument no one thought possible. When he set his guitar on fire at the 1969 Newport Pop Festival, the act was without precedent. A year later, he was dead at 27. The coroner estimated Hendrix took as many as nine sleeping pills that faithful night and determined it was most likely an accident. To this day, many consider him the greatest guitarist who's ever lived. And in terms of the only thing he wrote about whether or not he's going to be in, he's in heaven and so forth, he said, we don't know how Hendrix felt about God or if he subscribed to a particular faith. But he did once say, quote, we call our music electric church music because it's like a religion to us. All these years later, I wish Jesus could have been included in that statement. Well, we do know about his religion. Uh, you know, he talks about how he got sounds out of his guitar that nobody could imagine happening. And he, he, he lit his guitar on fire, this epic experience like this. So, so, and he doesn't realize, doesn't contextualize it. What's going on there? John, that song that Hendrix lit is, is called Voodoo Child. And he looked at himself as a voodoo priest. I remember when, when I got saved, he, a lot of people heard my testimony, and I won't go deep into it other than to say one of my uh, staple experiences from getting into the occult and, and, and visualizing my success and doing the meditations when I was 16 and 17 was not only channeling a bunch of lyrics, and realizing that these entities were real in time, not right away. I'm back to my subconscious at first. And glorifying Satan, didn't realize what I was doing, didn't believe Satan existed, boom. But you know what? The state of paralysis I talk about, not only paralyzed, but there was that humming sound that would go through my head. Well, after I got saved, I knew that I knew that I knew, man, these guys, man, they made it big. I'm just some, you know, 16, 17 year old channeling lyrics and channeling music, playing trippy stuff that my friends are tripping out on. But guess what? These guys made it huge. And I'm gonna, I, I, I knew that I knew that I knew that they were involved in the same stuff because they'd gone so far. And I started looking at their lyrics, their interviews. I'm like, yep, they're all talking about demons and spirits and challenging spirits and so forth. And I read Excuse Me While I Kissed the Sky by, by a, a biography of Jimi Hendrix after he died. And in there, and by the way, it's interesting because in, in, in that particular book, it talks about how Jimmy would go through straits of prowess, couldn't move, and there'd be this sound that would be going through his head. And I'm like, yep, there it is. It's also the most popular song of all time that Robert Plant said he channeled. If your head is humming, it won't go in case you don't know, the piper's calling you to join him. And I've been able to document it throughout some of, a lot of history. And it's, it's, it's amazing. It's very real. But what he's doing is singing Voodoo Child, bro. 
and he's sacrificing his guitar. It's a demonic act. Greg Laurie, I'm sure, knows what voodoo is. You know, it's contacting the loa or the spirit entities. And the Bible tells us these are fallen angels, they're demons that possess your body. And he got these sounds out that Jimmy, that he says that, you know, people didn't think were possible. Where does that come from? Well, we're going to find out where it came from. And he definitely was religious. Let me read one quote from him. And he, this is the liner notes of his album, Electric Ladyland. Things like witchcraft, which is a form of exploration and imagination, have been banned by the establishment and called evil. It's because people are frightened to find out the full power of the mind. He was promoting witchcraft. He was into, he's the voodoo child. He's being used by these demonic entities. I mean, I tripped out when I, before I was a Christian. When I, my band was Zeppelin, all, all Zeppelin everywhere. But man, there was that one poster I reserved for Jimi Hendrix. Because even though Paige played the most incredible riffs I thought at the time and all that, when I listened to Hendrix, man, live, no one could touch him, man. And I thought he was like an alien from another. And, and he, guess what? He was he was possessed by alien entities, which we'll see. No, I, I think... Demonic entities, that is. It's, it's really sad, Joe, because he's talking about how great those were. And I know that, you know, maybe in, in Greg Laurie's head, he's thinking, you know, but if I can show that didn't give them the hope, maybe that's how the gospel comes in. But the truth is, is you're watching these men and women, he mentions Janis Joplin as well, be tormented. Mm -hmm. What did he die? He said nine, nine pills of sleeping pills. Mm -hmm. Why? That's because an accident. He had, and whether he was trying to kill himself or not, he did struggle with not being able to sleep. And I believe he was probably trying to get that humming to stop yeah. because they were demonic entities. Oppression. And you can hear right here in this clip from They Sold Their Souls for Rock and Roll, where the people closest to him talk about those very experiences that Jimmy went through. Jimi Hendrix opened himself up to demonic beings who used him to initiate the hippie youth into the counterculture revolution. Alan Douglas, the executive curator of Hendrix's musical estate, admitted his spirit possession. Now, one of the biggest things about Jimmy was what he believed, and he believed that he was possessed by some spirit, and I got to believe it myself, and that's what we had to deal with all the time, and he was very humble about discussing it with people because he didn't want people to feel like he was being uh, pretentious and so on, but he really believed it, right? and he was wrestling with it constantly. Jimi Hendrix's live-in girlfriend, Fane Pridgen, also spoke of Hendrix's admission to being demon-possessed and related his demon possession to the reception of his music. He used to always talk about uh, some devil or something was in him, you know, and he didn't have any control over it. He didn't know what made him act the way he acted and what made him say the things he said and and songs and different things like that just come out of him, you know. And But uh, at first I used to think it was a cop-out when he had really done me in, right? And uh, he'd say, I don't know what come over me, you know. I really can't understand it. And, you know, he used to just, you know, grab his hair or something or pull his hand or stand in the mirror or cry or something. Oh, Lord, it was so sad when he would cry. He was, maybe he was the first man or maybe the only man that I've ever seen cry, you know, but it just killed me when he cried because he felt like, it, I mean, it seems like to me he was so tormented and just torn apart and like he really was obsessed, you know, with something really evil, you know. And he said, you know, like you're from Georgia, you know, he said, I should know how, you know, people drive demons. He actually thought about, you know, if we ever go, because I used to talk about my grandmother and all her weird stuff, you know, and he used to talk about us going down there and uh, having some root lady or somebody see if she could drive this demon out of him. The truth is, when I hear that, I mean, these are the these are the songs, these are the the talent, where it's coming from, where it's being channeled from, and instead of feeling pity for them, instead of recognizing that people were paying money in order to see what demons had come out of him mm -hmm. he was miserable in all yeah. of it and he was you know oh man i i gotta get these demons out i can't sleep and the songs taking are coming pills. out of him through the demonic possession you would never have heard of Jimi hendrix as this incredible guitarist if he hadn't been possessed channeling the music of demons and when greg Laurie is exalting him as you know wow and who no thought of these and wow what a great performance it's like you're exalting demons do you get it and maybe he doesn't get it i want to Lord, have mercy on him. If he doesn't see it, have mercy on him and show him, but may he be brought to repudiate it so it doesn't lead so many people astray. But if he does see it, Lord, shake him up and bring him to repentance still because I'm concerned for him. No, it's so true. And and we want to look into a couple of people that he makes a, 
I guess, a plea that they actually did convert. And we want to look at them. And before we did, I wanted to contrast a little bit because we actually did a, not a documentary, but an interview with the pastor that helped lead Steve McQueen to the Lord. And Greg Glory actually did an entire documentary on it and so forth. And we did our own thing on it as well, focusing more on the gospel presentation specifically. And also with his pastor, some of the the details about what took place in that. And the difference between that and not only what we're going to look into between who somebody he calls the chameleon here and also others, the difference is, is that when we look at Steve McQueen, for example, we see wickedness that we expose as wicked for what it is, but then ultimately what led him to come to Christ before he even knew he had cancer and was dying and so forth. So I just wanted to point that out before we, see we get into that. We with Steve McQueen. We see a testimony. We see him when he's dying, feeling bad because he wished he could be alive longer to lead more people to lead people to Jesus. You know, heartfelt. You know, you don't see that with these guys. No, amen. And instead of seeing that, we're going to see some of the writings that he put together for none other than Bob Dylan. And now we have an entire video and an article that you can go to, and we'd be playing a couple clips from there as well. But there are a bunch of people who think Bob Dylan's a believer. There was pretty much three years, uh, it looks like, where he did profess some sort of faith. But uh, we uh, we have our struggles with that. But let's read from Greg Glory's and then play a couple of clips for you, some of the more recent ones as well. But this is from the book. It says, The Chameleon, Bob Dylan, is known for hiding behind his wayfarers and constantly changing his persona. He went from folk to electric rock, was the prophet of protest, and went again from Nashville crooner to circus ringleader. But in 1979, he became a very unexpected and outspoken follower of Jesus Christ. He even issued three gospel-infused albums to prove it. Throughout his career, fans and critics alike have struggled to figure him out. Now, I want to read some of the concluding parts of the art of the chapter he specifically wrote regarding Bob Dylan and his salvation. This is in page 73 after he has already shown a number of convoluted understandings of what he really believes. And he says this, the simple answer to the riddle of Robert Zimmerman may simply be this. He is Jewish. He is a Christian. He was born Jewish and he was born again to be a Christian. Being a Christian does not mean you are no longer Jewish. Jesus was Jewish. The apostles were as well, including the apostle Paul. It was to a well-known, deeply religious man and Jewish leader named Nicodemus that Jesus said, you must be born again. Bob Dylan certainly seemed to have that experience and has never denied it. So why should we question it? Like you and me, Bob Dylan is a work in progress. So Joe, just like you and me, Bob's just a work in progress. But ultimately, he came to Christ in the 70s, and he's been a believer this entire time. Even though he no longer professes Christ as his Lord and Savior, even though he's professed other religion since, uh, and but it's interesting because when you hear Greg Laurie preach, I guess it's only the people listening to him in the congregation uh, or that he preaches to and hear him by way of radio that need to make sure they're repentant and following Jesus because Greg Laurie has stated before that if you're not following Jesus right now, you've probably never been saved. But I guess if you're a really good musician, God gives you a pass. I don't know how he squares it, but it doesn't square with what he's preached before. But then again, maybe it is going with some of his newer teaching, relatively newer teaching, that you could be a believer without being a disciple, which contradicts the word of God, which repudiates that lie as a doctrine of demons when it warns that Satan's the father of lies and it warns that Satan basically told Eve, you know, you shall not surely die. And in the New Testament, we're told, brethren, uh, we are not debtors to the flesh to live after the flesh, Romans chapter 8, verses 12 and 13. Brethren, we're not debtors to the flesh to live after the flesh, for if you, shall, you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. And he's talking about spiritual death there, because he goes on to say, as many as are led by the Spirit, these are the children of God. Jesus said in John chapter 8, around verse 51, he said, he that keeps my word will never see death. It's not about physical death, obviously, because we all physically die. It's point of man wants to die, but after his judgment, it's about spiritual death. Bob Dylan, there's no indication that he's keeping God's word. In fact, he no longer confesses Christ as Lord. So why are we teaching something contrary to Scripture? And again, it's not just about him putting these guys on a pedestal. It's about the message this is giving to other people who are going apostate. 
It's letting them know that don't worry. You know what? You can have a confession like, you know, maybe John Lennon's at the end or Elvis Presley was reading a book on, on, on occultism and demonic powers and died, you know, an adulterer and he's still in glory. He rolled in the glory, as Greg says. So if they don't have anything to fear, certainly we have nothing to fear. That is, how many souls is this lie going to damn? You know? no, no, it's true. And, and it's interesting because that was his conclusion after writing throughout that chapter about a lot of the convoluted nature of his quote unquote walk with Christ, even where he quotes Bob Dylan saying, well, Jesus only preached for three years as well. Even quoting him when in a more recent interview, when asked if he belongs to any church that he said he belongs to the church of the poison mind. Yeah. So, so yeah. Hey, I don't know what church I that is, that but it ain't the church. That's not the Christian church. It's it's not the church one that the Jesus Christ mind. said specifically that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I, yeah. We need to have our minds renewed in Christ and have every thought brought captive to his obedience and taking certain songs from certain albums, as Great Glory does in this chapter regarding Bob Dylan, and saying, well, look, this is from his latest album, but don't read the lyrics of the other ones. Don't read the lyrics. This is a convoluted... And the first thing I thought reading this chapter, then reading some of the lyrics from the, the latest album that we have of Bob Dylan, was a double-minded man yeah. is unstable is in oh, yeah. all his ways. And this guy well, is more complicated than anyone I know. Commitment, another commitment he made. Yeah, that's that right. That's a, great, that's a great, that's a commit, great segue. Commitment to the devil. Because he's actually talked about, he's actually saying about this. And we're going to play a clip actually from the They Sold Their Souls to Rock and Roll where you can hear him and Eric Clapton singing a song about selling their soul at the crossroads. Bob Dylan sings a takeoff on this theme on Highway 49. And Eric Clapton sings Crossroads, which seems to be a lament for having once sold one's soul. Ginger Baker, formerly of Clapton's group Cream, says of Cream, quote, It happens to us quite often. It feels as though I'm not playing my instrument. Something else is playing it, and that same thing is playing all three of our instruments. That's what I mean when I say it's frightening sometimes. Maybe we'll all play the same phrase out of nowhere. It happens very often with us. You know, I know it went into Eric Clapton there a little bit, and but I hope people are seeing the well, it gets spiritual bit, it gets reality. Heavier, it gets way, thinking, we're gonna go. way yeah. heavier. But... Him singing those songs, we're gonna we're gonna see him actually talking here specifically to sixty minutes, and this is later in life. This is long after the three year profession of faith that he yeah. had made, and hear him talking about the master and commander and the deals that he's really made. When Dylan was asked by Ed Bradley of sixty minutes why he is still out there performing after all these years, which now is five decades, Dylan gives a chilling answer regarding a bargain he made with an invisible spiritual entity that he feels he must keep. Why do you still do it? Why are you still out here? Well, it goes back to the destiny thing. You know, I made a bargain with it, you know, a long time ago, and I'm holding up my hand. What was your bargain? To get where uh, I am now. Sh should I ask who you made the bargain with? <laughs> with, 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 you know, with the chief, uh, chief commander. On this earth? <laughs> and on this earth and, in, uh, and then in the world we can't see. Now, Joe, I, I've, I'm sad to say that I've had believers say, oh, that was the bargain he made with God, actually. Doesn't really seem to be that, especially with some of the history behind some of the bargaining he talks about with the crossroads as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And then the stuff he writes about and... You know, it's a and all the artists he hangs out with and so forth, a lot of occultists and stuff. And and yeah, he's talking about the prince and power of the air there. And he obviously, when he did that interview, he's not following the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not keeping that bargain. He's not preaching the gospel. He says, that brought me where I am now. Well, who brought him to where he was now? As an artist, that came long before he professed Christ. So he's talking about, you know, the crossroads deal or making it or signing a pact with the devil. Uh, it's just heartbreaking. Like you said, Chet, Chad, that quote, I've seen that quote too, where he says, uh, I think we might even quote it in that clip later on. Uh, by the way, you guys want to check out our video if you haven't checked it out. They sold their souls uh, for rock and roll. Uh, it's a 10-hour version where you get this and way more. And then uh, some of these things are on our YouTube site, which you can go there anytime and check it out. Uh, but the, people need to be the wake-up call in the church because a lot of young people are into these. Most Christians are into secular music, Chad. And... I can't, there's a difference in your walk. When you're in the Lord and you're meditating on his word and you're praising God and you're you're using music to glorify God, man, your walk gets stronger. 
you know. But when you're soaking your brain in music that's filthy and, and godless, what comes in, the Bible says, Jesus says, will come out, you know. So it's very important that we walk with the Lord. But it's really sad that you uh, can see the evidence here and still act like these guys are right with God. You know, no, it is sad. And, you know, when we, we're, we're going to look at one more artist on this. But as Joe mentioned, we do have They Sold Their Souls to Rock and Roll. You can see a myriad of artists on there. And we also, on this very YouTube channel, make sure you're just subscribed to it because you can go through. We have a ton of clips on here. We have an entire video on Bob Dylan. And when we look at this next artist, this is somebody, Joe, that I got to be honest, when somebody said, well, he's a Christian, I said, wow, that's crazy. I can't believe that this man would be a Christian. There's been so many tall tales even made up about Ozzy Osbourne and Alice Cooper and some of the stuff that they had done that yeah. I think some of it's just folklore yeah. uh, nonetheless. But when we look at Alice Cooper, I, I got to ask before we look at some of the even some of the clips of him playing music and stuff, is it not absolutely just mind boggling to you how many people are like, oh, this guy is just an outright Christian. It's so awesome. We have a Christian right there in the rock and roll scene to preach the gospel. Yeah, it's it's a lot of these folks that are saying that I just feel, you know, they just don't know better. They just think, oh, he made a profession of faith. Oh, he's a Christian now. Praise God. Uh, the Bible says you'll know them by their fruit. And uh, he still does a lot of the old songs that he used to do that are very demonic. Uh, he still he tours, get this, he tours with Marilyn Manson. Marilyn Manson is, he says in his biography, you know, uh, that he is was certified by Satanist Anton LaVey to become a member of the Church of Satan. And most people know he had the tour Antichrist Superstar. He he went in, in his chapter in his autobiography about the rules. It starts off with, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, quoting Lester Crowley. He sings about Thelema and Crowley's teaching. He's a Satanist. And guess what? He goes on tour together with Marilyn Manson, and they're very good friends. By the way, Marilyn Manson has just been outed by a number of gals as being sexually abusive. That's at least the allegations. And, of course, when he's interviewed, oh, they're just allegations, you know. And, uh, you know, and he, he's good friends with him, but just it's not just that. He goes on stage with him and supports him. Would any of you support going on stage and support a guy that's promoting Satanism and all the youth are there and singing with him and They'll sing songs like, you know, uh, I'm 18, or they'll do Come Together by the Beatles. And by the way, when he's doing Come Together with the Beatles, or by the Beatles, you have Marilyn Manson in, in doing that, uh, that, sh that song together, collaborating with, with Alice Cooper, a Satanist, man, with Alice Cooper. And then also you have Johnny Depp there. Steven uh, Tyler. He's on guitar. Yeah, Steven Tyler. Johnny Depp, man, he says, literally, he says, you know, that, he, 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 you know, the whole thing with the whole trial right now. It's come out where he's he's become supposedly this monster, you know. Well, Johnny Depp himself said there's like 30 demons in him, 30 yep. spirit entities in him. I think he might even said demons. And Steven Tyler, and he's the one guy, one of the very few huge artists that we don't deal with and they sold their souls to rock and roll. So they didn't look into him in depth, but guess what I found later? He admitted later, uh, and Vanity Fair did an article on it, but it's in his biography where he said, man, he wasn't making it as a rock star, but then he started practicing uh, Lester Crowley's sex magic. And he got together with a gal, and they had a sexual experience. And during the time when, you know, they 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 cried out, they prayed. Well, they're not praying to God, to these satanic forces, right? That's what Crowley taught anyway. Uh, so uh, what else but spirit entities? And he said, boom, then he made it big. Stephen Tyler. So you got all these people that are in touch with demons and practicing Crowley and magic and so forth. Alice Cooper's, you know, bird of a feather, man, flocked together. And you're going to tell me he's a Christian? I don't care how much you go to church, man. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to uh, a donut shop makes you a police officer. Amen? No, and it's sad. In fact, in a interview he did with Business Standard, it quotes, and it talks about him. It says, the 68-year-old veteran musician songs contain lyrics about sex, debauchery, and fictional evil characters. And this is just a stage persona. He doesn't take too seriously. And he's quoted as saying, I don't think they saw the humor in what I was doing. Rock and roll horror, and comedy are all in bed together. And I'm going to read these lyrics for you. Before this you is go from, on, Chad, I want to yes. say something about comedy. You know who, who who's a, tries to be a comic and tries to make it humorous? Anton LaVey, the head of Church of Satan. Mm -hmm. You know who else does that? When Because I've studied him and I've revealed how demonic he is and all these connections with him. It's Satan and Celeste Crowley. He uses a lot of humor because that lets you get your guard down. 
not to take it too seriously. Before you know it, you're entertaining darkness. You open yourself to the demonic world. No, and I think that's a good point, and because when we read the lyrics, and you can see right here in this video, he is specifically playing this song, Feed My Frankenstein. And I want to read some of the lyrics. We're not going to play it for you, but I want you to, to watch him. No, this is what he is singing. Feed my Frankenstein. Meet my libido. He's a psycho. Feed my Frankenstein. Hungry for love, and it's lunchtime. I don't even want to go in any further. Did I say something about babies there? I, I don't even want... Yeah, he... Yeah. Whoa, whoa, baby chow down. But I'll be, uh, but I want to uh, say something about Baby yeah. chow down, I know in that song. On his stage, I mean, he has mangled and butchered babies all over the place. I mean, that, you know, dolls, you know? I mean, this is wicked. And he was the Marilyn Manson of his day. But guess what? He says, now my music doesn't shock. That's because Satan pushed the envelope. We can only go so far. Now it's Marilyn Manson. And by the way, Alice Cooper, named after a woman using makeup... That's exactly what Marilyn Manson did. Marilyn, named after a woman, using makeup. I mean, they're birds of feather. No wonder they collaborate together, Chad. No, it is true. And when we see this, and we see this guy telling us that he's a Christian, he believes the whole Bible, you know, all this stuff, but then he's doing this, and the Bible is very clear that you shouldn't be coarse jesting. Like, this is disgusting, and the fact that these intermingle, and you can just sit there, and you can co-mingle with absolute wickedness that you can watch walk arm and arm together playing satanic music for people literally with satanists when the bible is clear we should not be unevenly yoked with the non-believer if i believed alice was a believer and guys i wish i could say it gets better but it doesn't it gets worse in fact this video that we're going to be playing is actually from an expose on the artist kesha and the fact that she literally plays in one of her videos, Die Young, a satanic cult leader. And in this video, you're going to see Alice Cooper and Kesha together. And by the way, if you look on the stage, you see a dancing phallus. I mean, this is disgusting. You got to check it out. In a duet featuring Alice Cooper and Kesha entitled What Baby Wants, Kesha is depicted as the devil in a dress, quote, taking your bleeding heart and your soul, no regrets. She'll take your bleeding heart and your soul, no regrets. When her victim wants out, Kesha tells him it's too late. And now it's too, too, too late for you. And as the devil's servant sings, quote, and now it's too late for you. She also says, I'm going to drain your veins and bathe in your blood. I'm going to drain your veins and bathe in your blood. She says a little bit later, I'll make you sit, beg, roll over, play dead. I'll make you sit, beg, roll over, play dead. Because as the song says, what Satan or baby wants, Satan gets. Alice Cooper, who collaborated with Kesha on the song, admitted that Kesha is playing the role of Satan and stated, quote, We decided to call it What Baby Wants, Baby Gets because in the song, he tries to say, Hey, that wasn't part of the deal. And she says, No, no, no. You don't understand what baby wants, baby gets, end quote. In other words, folks, in the end, Satan gets the souls of those who think it's all just a game. Kesha, it so happens, is just another dupe tool that Satan is using as a prince and the power of the air to draw the deluded masses to hell. Joe, when I see that clip, I see just absolute debauchery. But when I read in Greg Laurie's book and I watch in interviews that he's done with Alice Cooper, in fact, they're pictured together on the back of this book. These are some of the things that he says. He says, the showman, the Alice Cooper band changed rock music forever and their signature sound, surrealistic stage show and Alice's over the top horror inspired persona. Their 1973 tour not only shattered all previous box office records, but defined the modern era of touring. Alice and his band of musical brothers chugged, snorted, inhaled, imbibed, ripped, tripped, and tweaked on all of the devil's candy they could lay their hands on. He is proof that God does give second, third, and fourth chances in life, amazing grace, until we draw our last breath. But Joe... When I read that and see that, and then only to find out that while he was under the influence of all those things, these were the songs he was writing, and yet I'm supposed to believe that a conversion to Christ, that you don't change, you don't avoid the appearance of evil anymore, no sanctification in terms of that, you're singing all of this nonsense. In fact, Greg Laurie in the book talks about going to his show and then going to church with him in the morning and having this great relationship with him 
how on earth am I supposed to read the scriptures and see this going on and saying, yeah, that's a sanctified man growing in holiness? Yeah, well, uh, Lori needs to face up the fact that these guys, when he's with Marilyn Manson, that's the church of the poison mind that Dylan mentioned. Uh, you're getting Marilyn Manson and him on stage together. Marilyn Manson plunges broken beer bottles into his chest and cuts himself open. We expose him in our video. Uh, sexual perversion on stage. Takes the Bible and mocks God and, and speaks of, wickedly of God. Rips pages out of the Bible, rips the Bible up, and so forth. And he says, Marilyn Manson is one of my good friends, you know. He's up there promoting him. How can a true born blood-bought believer that loves Jesus promote someone who he knows is going, and his fans are going to turn on Marilyn Manson. Marilyn Manson has been made in, in his image, you know, in a lot of ways, and just brought even further. And how could he How could he promote him and support the wicked, you know? And also, let's keep this in mind. I'm sorry. I've looked at what he said. He, I'm sorry. He needs to repent. Uh, Alice Cooper is a liar because Alice Cooper, he says, well, yeah, but, uh, you know, uh, Marilyn Manson is into the occult. Yeah, but he should be supporting him and, and turning your fans on him and acting like he's a great guy and doing concerts with him, man. But guess what? He says that Marilyn Manson, uh, well, Marilyn Manson's into the occult, and I was, we were never in the occult. That's not true. So I said he's, he's, not, he's not honest. Uh, in fact, listen to this. This is in his Me Alice, his, his biography. He admits, how did he get his name? He says, both Charlie Carnell and Dick were friendly with Mrs. Uh, Paxson's daughter, who claimed her mother was clairvoyant and could help us solve our problems. She was an occultist. She was in touch with spirits. Alice Paxson also had a Ouija board. And we started asking questions. That's before they had the name Alice Cooper. Okay, they had a different name at the time. I wasn't even working the board when we asked if there was a spirit in the room. There was. The board spelled out the name Alice Cooper. For three hours, everyone drilled the board on Alice Cooper. And then they went with that. And then he said, he added some things to the story, but he says in the book that I'm being true with what happened here. And then I had made some things up about who Alice Cooper was in the past and stuff and so forth. But uh, that's where he said he got his name through an occult experience. So did he change the name of when he became a Christian from Alice Cooper? That wasn't his name, guys. Uh, from this name, this demonic entity gave him because he knows, he says Satan exists. He knows these spiritual demons now. They changed the name. Well, guess what? It gets, it gets worse. Check this out. Alice Cooper's lead guitarist, uh, Michael Bruce, admitted in 2005, he says, we went down a couple of times when they, speaking of the doors, were recording and watched them record. And so they came to our house in Topanga Canyon. It was Bruce Botnick, the engineer for uh, Paul Rothschild, Arthur Lee, David Crosby, and Jim Morrison. What a lineup. We sat in a circle and held hands and chanted trying to bring some spirits or something. Dennis Dunaway, Alice Cooper's bass guitarist, admitted, we had a seance during a Halloween party at our house in Topanga Canyon. The Doors' girlfriends, Pam and Peggy, and Pam was a witch, uh, claimed to be a witch, married Jim Morrison in a witchcraft wedding. Pam and Peggy, who were great friends of ours, they decided they were going to have Lee from Love, David Crosby, Paul Rothschild, The Doors, and all of a sudden, our house was full of these cool musicians and music people. And we had a seance that night. And it was pretty heavy, actually. There was a candle in the middle and creepy shadows dancing on the walls. Jim Morrison was deep into it with Michael Bruce. Jim Morrison, by the way, keep in mind, if you watch our video, They Sold Their Souls for Rock and Roll, we show where he said he, uh, you know, that he was possessed by demons. He says the spirits are still in him. He talks about how he became a street person. Uh, he was on Venice Beach sleeping on a roof at night. And he met the spirit of music, Satan. And the first concerts, he was seeing concerts that were being given to him by the enemy. And then he, those first songs he wrote, he was just taking notes of these. It's, it's demonic, guys, okay? Jim Morrison, by the way, I know he mentions him in there. Yes, Jim Morrison says, sings about cancel my subscription to the resurrection. Cancel my subscription to the resurrection. Send my credentials to the house of detention. I got some friends inside. He was a Satanist. Jim Morrison, he says, was deep into it. It's not about into the seance and contacting these demons with Michael Bruce, our guitarist, holding one of his hands and Alice Cooper holding the other as they were in the circle. The girl who was performing it was someone who we knew. Uh, a little further down, it says she started freaking out and started really freaking me out and talking in this almost demonic Linda Blair voice. It all ended during this girl's freak out with Glenn Buxton, who had had too much to drink that night, falling through a hole from the upstairs and crashing in the middle of the circle. It wasn't planned. It was just that the craziest thing ever, but the timing 
couldn't have been more creepy uh, to those of us who saw it. So we're talking about uh, we're talking about Alice Cooper getting their names from a demon, getting the name from a demon. Okay, and we're talking about his band members talking about the same experience with Alice Cooper, Jim Morrison, who claimed to be possessed, and other artists contacting spirits and calling them out. We've been warning people that this is the reality, and we want to act like, hey, you know what? Well, Alice Cooper. Well, he said he was never in the occult. Well, guess what? How can I trust him? I can't. And then if he says, you know what? I actually, those guys all made that, all that stuff they just made up. It was just lies. Well then, or yeah, we did that, but I repent of all the occultism now. Well, the Bible says, you know, a bad company corrupts good morals. So you'd be hanging out and not just hanging out, man. If you were witnessing to him and bringing him with Jesus, that'd be one thing. But when you're up there doing dark music, that when you were under the influence of these demonic entities that you were receiving, you became the biggest artists as far as touring for a while and while you're laboring under these demonic spirits and you're doing a lot of those same songs you're doing songs with Marilyn Manson who is a confessed Satanist who hates Jesus Christ and then you're supporting what he's doing man that I'm sorry there's no way that could be justified no I couldn't agree more and and this is the the seriousness we want to speak to this and I know that Joe that for most people watching this they're probably a believer and I'm, I'm praying that you will be sanctified by this that this would turn your heart to say, you know what, I shouldn't be listening to this stuff. There's no way this is going to benefit my walk with Christ. And I hope That's right. and pray that you read the words that we see so clearly also in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, when it tells us to run our weight race with endurance. One of the things that it says is to lay aside every sin. And I believe some of this music, it's not just an encumbrance, right? It is literal sin to sit there next to the seat of scoffers and disobey God and watch people mock the, the king that you say you serve. These are mediums. We're not supposed to be seeking mediums. 100%. And you mo you're listening to songs and meditating on that which mocks them. And yet going back, oh, no, it's totally fine. That's okay. And I hope that you see that and re recognize you need to set it aside so you can run your race with endurance, but also the encumbrance. Those things that maybe they're not sin, but they're keeping you from running your race with endurance. Let nothing keep you from that. But Joe, I want to ask you, I know this is a, a documentary we're doing now that we've put together here for these people. And there are plenty of people that don't know Christ, and maybe they're just clicking on it because they want to hear their artists talked about. So, Joe, what would you say to someone that these are their favorite artists? What is, a, what is a message of hope that you can give after finding out that so many of their favorite artists were actually involved in wickedness, witchcraft, wizardry, and demons were the ones that were ultimately the sirens calling them to their favorite idols? What would you say to those people? Well, it's funny. You just ended your sentence with almost with their favorite idols because that was exactly what was going through my mind when you were talking, Chad, is that uh, we just did a message in, in our fellowship. Uh, we just preached on Revelation 21.8. We've been working our way through the book of Revelation, and it talks about uh, those who are on the list of the damned. It's the, it's the vice list of the damned who will go to the lake of fire, who will experience the second death rather than the resurrection to eternal life in Christ. And that uh, passage warns of those, of those who are into idolatry. And idol, an idol is anything that you put before God. It, it's not just uh, you know images that are made out of sticks and stones and and and, and tree trunks. Uh, you can be shaving your idol, right? Uh, you, you can be your idol. The Bible says, "Last days, men will be lovers of self." You could be parking your idol in your garage or your car, in your in your uh, 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 you know front in front of your house, it's your car, or whatever. You have to turn from idolatry. The Bible says, "Greed is idolatry." In Colossians chapter three, so we have to turn from all of our idols, but certainly. Uh, I was just uh, being interviewed by a ministry called Licensed the Parent on the radio, and uh, the, the the gentleman that interviewed me, they uh, that Shepherd Hill Academy, they they take kids for a year straight, man. Kids leave their music, their iPhones, their romances all aside because, as he mentioned, a lot of these kids have one foot in the prison and one foot in the in the grave, and there's half of them are suicidal when they first come, but they see these radical transformations. He says a lot of it has to do with getting them away from the music. And he said something interesting to me, Chad. He said, he said, you know, uh, Joe, he goes, as addictive as the drugs are, right? He said, you know what's harder for them to give up than the drugs? Is their music. Because it has such an addictive pull on them. And he recognizes, he's, he's actually shows our presentation. He sold their souls for rock and roll to the kids as part of the year course. And he sees these radical transformations when they get out of all this music and everything. And it's just important that we understand that uh, if you're putting music before Jesus, you're like, you know, uh, Jesus, just don't touch my music and I'll follow you. Well, then you're not really following him because the Lord God said the first of the commandments is that you shall have no gods, be not, no gods before him because those are all idols. Whatever you put before Jesus is an idol. And the greatest commandment, Jesus says, is thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart and soul and 
Holy Strength, and all that mind means to truly turn to the Lord, you know? Not just say, oh yeah, I believe you, Jesus, but I'll be your disciple because Greg Laurie said I didn't have to really follow you. No, if you're an idolater, you're not following the Lord, Revelation 28, you're going to the lake of fire, okay? You need to repent, you need to turn to Jesus. And you gotta keep in mind too, listen to 2 Chronicles chapter 19, verse two. I think Greg Laurie, I think everybody in the audience, I think Chad and I, we all need to take this to heart. Should you help the wicked, should he be up there with Marilyn Manson? a minister in the church of Satan? Should you help the wicked? I'm talking about uh, Alice Cooper there. Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? You can't do that, Alice. Not if you love Jesus. You can't do that. Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Because of this, the wrath of the Lord is upon you. We would encourage you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, to turn from all this wickedness Realize that your life is a vapor. Our lives go really quick compared to eternity. And you're going to stand before God because it says it's appointed to man once to die, but after this, the judgment. You need to make sure you are right with God before you leave planet Earth, man. And that means, Jesus said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And repentance means to have a change of heart, a change of mind, which leads to a turning away from darkness, not just in your heart and mind, but in your lifestyle, and turning to Christ, turning to the light of Jesus, Listen to what the scriptures warn. This is so important that you hear this, man. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 says, Do not be unevenly yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them. I will walk among you. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you. If you if you do that, I'll be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So Jesus, the God, words, God's word says in John 1, 12, as many as received him, that has received Jesus, he gave the right to become the children of God. If you turn from darkness and you embrace Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior, and, and, and trust what he did on the cross of Calvary for you, where he shed his blood, poured out his blood for your sins. Understand this, I don't care what you've done, how evil you've been, whatever your past is. Paul said that God saved him as the chief of sinners. He says it's a faithful saying that Jesus Christ came to the world to save sinners, of which I am chief, I'm the worst. But Paul went on to say why Jesus saved him as the worst sinner, because he was having Christians killed, because he said he was a pattern, that if God would save him, the worst sinner, he would save you and me, and Chad. And Chad and I were really bad too. And you know what Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I won't cast away. You just come to him right now and say, Lord God, I turn to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And if you're coming to him as your Lord right now, guess what? You're gonna be forgiven of all your sins. You're gonna be cleansed of all unrighteousness. Anything you've done, you're gonna have a, a clean slate. And then you just continue to trust and follow Jesus, get into his word, grow in the faith, find a God-fearing, uh, Jesus-loving, Holy Spirit-filled church where they just love Jesus. And guess what? You'll be blessed now and forevermore. But one thing you want to do is beware of Satan's schemes because we're not to be ignorant of his devices. And thank God and praise him daily in song, in worship, from lips and hearts of thanksgiving for the salvation he has brought you in Christ Jesus. And when you realize what Jesus did, you don't want to go back to this vomit, man. You don't want to go back to this mud. You want to just worship the Lord and give him glory and live for him. By the way, I'm going to tell you right now, Jimi Hendrix's music, which... Jimi Hendrix said it just came through him by demons, isn't going to be in heaven, okay? And I hope to see Greg there. But guess what? He's not going to be singing Imagine in heaven, which says, Imagine there's no heaven. We need to get excited about Jesus, man, and lift up the name of Jesus and preach Jesus. Love you guys. Press on him. God bless you guys. We love you.